Boa tarde. Nós vamos dar início, então, aos trabalhos do nosso Seminário Internacional Ciência Aberta, Questões Abertas. É, eu gostaria de convidar para a mesa de abertura o Alexandre Abdo, da Open Knowledge Brasil, Grupo Ciência Aberta, Universidade de São Paulo. A Maria Lúcia Maciel, que é uma co coordena junto comigo o LINC, Laboratório Interdisciplinar sobre Informação e Conhecimento, que é um laboratório conjunto do IBICT e da UFRJ. Ludmila Guimarães... É, da Unirio, é, representando aqui tanto o reitor da Unirio quanto a coordenadora do Centro de Educação à Distância da Unirio. E Cecília Leite, diretora do IBICT, Instituto Brasileiro de Informação em Ciência e Tecnologia. Queria primeiro agradecer é, a oportunidade de estarmos todos aqui, pessoas de várias partes do mundo, brasileiros de várias regiões do Brasil, para discutir um tema que para nós é muito caro, novo também, né, para, para as instituições de ensino e pesquisa brasileiras, mas eu acredito que para a sociedade em geral. Né. E é uma iniciativa, portanto, conjunta, que é, a gente espera que esteja dando, seja o primeiro passo de uma rede de um, que já existe, que a gente possa começar a participar mais ativamente dessa rede para discutir as questões envolvidas aí né, nisso que se chama de ciência aberta. É, eu não posso deixar de agradecer a todos que fizeram os esforços né, para que esse evento possa acontecer, trazendo tantas pessoas de fora, enfim, e, portanto, ao CNPq, ao IBICT, à FAPERJ, à CAPES, à Unirio, o CBPF, à RNP, o PPGCI, que é o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciência da Informação. Né? É, tivemos aí, antes, atividades pré-seminários, que foram pré-seminário, que foram as oficinas de ciência aberta, que nos tivemos aí durante, ao longo de dois dias, cerca de sete oficinas acontecendo. Acho que foi uma experiência muito rica, que a gente espera poder replicar, acho que foi uma primeira experiência. E agradecer a todos aqueles que botaram a, a mão na massa, né, como a gente diz, para fazer esse evento. Além de nós, que estamos aqui na mesa, né, que eu já mencionei, as equipes de apoio da Unirio, que todos os esforços aí para pegar as pessoas, viabilizar a vinda dos brasileiros, né, uma das apoiadoras da publicação que a gente pretende fazer a partir daqui, é, o pessoal do IBICT de Brasília, o pessoal do IBICT do Rio de Janeiro, Selma e sua equipe, nossos, nossos alunos de iniciação científica, de mestrado e doutorado, Helena, Sabrina, Anne Clínio, André Apel, enfim, eu acho que é uma, uma enormidade de pessoas que a gente tem que agradecer muitíssimo por esse apoio voluntário né, a essa a organização desse evento. Então, eu vou passar a palavra para Alexandre Abdo, para ele dizer algumas palavras. Bom, bom dia a todos, boa tarde. É, eu estou super contente de estar aqui. A gente, ano passado, é, só para contar um pouquinho de, de, do processo, talvez muito rapidamente, um grupo de colegas aí que tocavam, se encontravam em, em eventos, encontros científicos, começou a reconhecer que existia é, uma massa crítica de pessoas interessadas diretamente em trabalhar de maneira mais é, colaborativa, mais com espírito mais público dentro da ciência, e, e que havia uma série de fatores que no nosso dia a dia criavam uma resistência a isso, fatores institucionais, mas também fatores da nossa própria dificuldade de, de, de não conhecer essas práticas, de, de não estar compartilhando sobre essas práticas, aprendendo com o erro dos outros, com os acertos dos outros. E a gente começou a, a criar uma lista de e-mail, a trocar ideias e a partir daí é, fizemos ano passado um primeiro encontro né que foi muito feliz a gente conseguiu fazer tudo de maneira é, bastante é, colaborativa e aberta com tudo registrado online e tal é, e ver isso tomar forma e ser abraçado de certa forma é, e abraçado mutuamente, né? um abraço mesmo, não, não um, um, uma fagocitação, mas um abraço bem caloroso é, por, 
por pessoas maravilhosas que estão aqui e, e aí sentadas também. É incrível. Eu espero que a gente possa fazer um ótimo seminário. A gente, sem dúvida, tem material é, dos dois lados e online também. A gente vai ter participação remota. É, mais do que suficiente. Então, muito obrigado a todos. O evento está sendo transmitido né, em tempo real, tem um endereço aí para o streaming. Não sei se, talvez depois a gente devesse colocar ali para quem quiser divulgar. E também nós estamos filmando, gravando e filmando o evento. Né, então, a ideia é depois a gente ter um vídeo é, de, de, do seminário que vai ser amplamente disponibilizado aí para aqueles que não puderam vir e aqueles que gostariam de rever alguns dos grandes bons momentos, os grandes momentos do seminário. Então, eu passo a palavra para Maria Lúcia Marcel. Tarita já agradeceu várias pessoas e entidades que eu também agradeço. Já isso é óbvio. Quero também agradecer ao Alexandre, que nos fez, em grande parte, descobrir esse novo mundo, que é um mundo que eu estou achando fascinante e que a gente descobriu nesse primeiro encontro no Rio, que ele esqueceu de dizer, disse que foi ótimo, só que não tira... acabou a luz aqui, nesse auditório, repentinamente. Alguém, tá... Alguém lá estava aqui, porque estava dizendo, é, pois é. E, é, em cinco minutos, a Sarita arrumou lá fora um auditório no jardim. Claro, não tínhamos a tela, mas foi muito agradável, não foi? muito legal. Então, enfim, nossa história com o Alexandre vem mais ou menos daí, eu agradeço. Agradeço a vocês todos por estarem aqui, é muito bom. Agradeço aos que vieram de fora, que aceitaram o nosso convite. Alguns deles vieram de muito longe, tipo Singapura, Austrália, enfim. Agradeço a todos vocês. É, para nós isso está sendo muito importante. Nós estamos entrando num campo novo de pesquisa e eu confesso que eu estou fascinada. É, eu não vou falar muito mais, mas eu queria só contar que na semana passada eu aprendi uma coisa que eu não sabia. Não sei se vocês sabem, que não é toda e qualquer abelha que faz mel. Vocês sabiam disso? Eu não sabia. Eu acho, para mim, a abelha faz mel, ponto. Mas não. Não são todas que fazem mel. Muitas abelhas, elas simplesmente se reproduzem, botam os ovos lá num, num cantinho, vão embora e fecham a porta, por assim dizer. Elas fecham a entrada e vão embora, não acontece mais nada. Simplesmente os outros nascem e vão repetir o mesmo ciclo de vida, sem qualquer tipo de produção. E aí existem as chamadas abelhas sociais, as abelhas que trabalham juntas e que produzem, e essas produzem mel, cera, própolis, é, geleia real, e elas trabalham juntas, é um monte de abelha trabalhando junto. Então, eu acho que nós temos aqui algo em comum com as abelhas, eu acho que nós vamos ser muito mais produtivos trabalhando todo mundo junto. Vamos lá. Então, vou chamar a Ludmilla. E o Ibic de 60 anos. Você esqueceu do lixo? Mas eu não ah. esqueci de 60 anos. Eu esqueci de falar do site do grupo de trabalho. Quem está assistindo e não conhece ainda, o site cienciaaberta.net é a porta de entrada para participar desse grupo de trocas, de experiências e, e de aprendizados e de é, espaço também de, eventualmente, lutas aí que a gente vai precisar fazer para que tem espaço essa forma de encarar o nosso trabalho científico. Já viram que essa mesa, em termos de marketing institucional, é zero. Né? Ludmilla. Boa tarde a todos. É um prazer estar aqui nessa mesa de abertura, é, representando né, o reitor da Universidade Federal do Estado de Janeiro e a Coordenação Geral de Educação à Distância. É, passo coro aqui com a potência dos afetos do, do Alexandre, né, e colocado muito bem pela, pela Maria Lúcia, de que somente esse trabalho 
colaborativo somente, essa integração e esse compartilhamento de recursos, que no final das contas é produto né, desse afeto, né, desse conjunto de ideias e de crenças que nós partilhamos e que possibilita que estejamos todos aqui e que, poss e que podemos avançar né, é, em, em rumo a coisas novas, a criações, que é bem a tônica né, desse seminário, quando a gente vê o que os nossos... É, palestrantes, o que os nossos conferencistas vêm fazendo, não é nada mais do que essa potência dos afetos, através dos trabalhos com as comunidades, com as novas opções de ferramentas, de instrumentos, é esse partilhar, é essa ideia né, de uma comunidade que extrapola os territórios e as fronteiras, né, que o Alexandre é, bem, bem coloca, a Sarita, a Luca, né, e provavelmente também a Cecília. Né? Com muito carinho é que eu estou aqui nesse, nesse momento, porque faço parte né, dessa, desses afetos, né, e sou cria dessa, dessa escola, e foi um prazer receber alguns professores no aeroporto, tá estar nessa, nessa mão na massa, é, viabilizando né, algumas coisas, para que nesse somatório possamos todos crescer e caminhar adiante. Então, muito obrigada a todos e que tenhamos um excelente evento. Obrigada. Acho que aqui está dando. Bom, obrigado. Em primeiro lugar, agradeço o convite da Sarita para estar aqui compartilhando desse momento, no ano em que o IBICT comemora os seus 60 anos, e esse evento faz parte dessas comemorações, porque, na verdade, ele vem ao encontro do que sempre foi uma das missões e uma das metas do IBICT, que, foi, que é o acesso aberto à informação. A gente já vem trabalhando nisso antes de ser denominado dessa forma, mas a gente sempre teve essa ideia de que a informação tem que ser aberta, tem que ser livre, tem que ser compartilhada, para que ela possa gerar efetivamente conhecimento, desenvolvimento e inovação nesse novo momento. Então, eu parabenizo a todos que organizaram esse evento, a importância que ele tem, se mede pela distância das pessoas que aqui vieram, nesse abraço ao acesso aberto, e isso fortalece muito o IBICT e esse novo momento dele, na medida em que está no seu plano de ação para esses próximos quatro anos, o desenvolvimento muito forte dessa questão do acesso aberto, dos repositórios para isso, do, do Big Data, do mapa de competência. Nós estamos com várias iniciativas nesse sentido e acho que tudo isso se soma àquilo que está sendo discutido aqui e acredito que vá enriquecer o que nós estamos fazendo. Então, eu quero desejar sucesso absoluto, dizer que para o IBICT é uma grande alegria fazer parte desse grupo que está levando esse movimento à frente, e que esperamos que daqui saiam frutos que possam render, assim como foi colocado a questão das abelhas, possam render geleia real, porque eu acho que a gente tem aqui todas as operárias, todos os tipos de, de, de trabalho para que isso aconteça, mas que, no fundo, a gente possa render um conhecimento maior, uma integração maior e a possibilidade de desenvolvimento desses, desses projetos que para o IBICT são extremamente caros e importantes. Muito obrigada e sucesso durante esses dias. É, vamos ao trabalho. É, é, peço, então, que a gente desfaça a mesa de abertura, que a Luca se mantenha aí para conduzir, então, a nossa sessão, nossa conferência de abertura. Thank you for your patience. Again, I want to thank the, uh, the organizers for the invitation uh, to come uh, to, uh, to Brazil and to Rio. This is my first visit uh, to, uh, to this wonderful country. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, the other, uh, some of the other speakers uh, with whom uh, I've spent uh, some of the workshop time which is uh, help in my uh, education to catch up uh, with the, the this is not, not work, working. Hello? OK. I have to hold this in my teeth. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe it's better this way? 
not so good that way. I don't know what is generating the positive feedback from that, but in any case. Uh, the, as I was saying, uh, I've had uh, an, an education uh, in uh, what I've uh, come to call uh, uh, the, the new open science movement. Uh, because what I want to talk uh, about today is uh, open science, the Republic of Open Science, uh, which is an old set uh, of, in, of institutions and an old mode of conducting research. Uh, so we might uh, want to call it the traditional open science movement, as opposed to the plans for the renewal of open science uh, for the 21st century and, and beyond, which I've been hearing about. Um, so what I want to do is to, to start with a perspective of where I have come from. Um, the discipline I have come from is from economics. And uh, I've been in, involved uh, not in an uh, institute of politics and economics directly, but in an uh, institute concerned with uh, research on economic policies and economic policy issues, which include issues of science policy, modern science policy. And the other place that I've come from is from the past, uh, not, be, not only because I'm very old, uh, but uh, because I've studied the past, uh, because I believe uh, that there are many things about the existing world which are very difficult to understand uh, unless you know how they got that way. And that many things uh, which we are coping with, or struggling with, or find uh, irrational uh, are legacies from the past, which have persisted uh, because they have an important functional value, which has kept them uh, alive and able to resist uh, sort of the, uh, the pressures uh, for change or, or disintegration. Uh, and they are being renewed. Consequently, the renewal takes place in terms of a uh, adaptation and continual evolution of the earlier uh, forms. Uh, it is not uh, usually a complete revolution which discards, uh, which discards them uh, because, as I've said, uh, they persist uh, as legacies because they continue to have some functional value even though uh, they are not perfect institutions uh, or perfectly adapted to changing needs. So this is the context in which uh, I, want to, uh, I want to approach this problem. So here, uh, uh, this is a, a menu, but um, uh, for, the, for, for this uh, talk, this is not a menu from which you can, uh, which you are freely order. So it's one of those uh, restaurants where you get a set menu the question is whether whether you want whether you want to take that dish or not, uh, but that's uh, that's what is on offer. Uh, uh, so I will start uh, by trying, uh, as uh, I was taught uh, uh, by uh, more senior people when I began a teaching career very long ago, before we had uh, we had any digital technologies or or even were supposed to provide graphical information in classroom presentations other than what we could draw on the blackboard. Uh, that's sort of a motivation uh, for this topic and for the work that I've done uh, on the economics of research and the economic history uh, of research organizations. Uh, so this is the motivation. And I will try to, uh, uh, to follow the advice that I was given, which was, in giving a lecture, you first tell people what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them. And then you conclude by telling them what you've told them. Okay? And this is the formula uh, for, uh, for, sta for standard uh, lec uh, lecturing. Uh, okay, and so we, we will start with this program. Uh, so I start with the critical importance of exploratory research for major advances in scientific knowledge. Distinguishing here uh, between 
exploratory research and including in that long-term mission-oriented uh, research activities and distinguished from uh, short-term uh, applied research and particularly research uh, which is intended to have co commercial applications. Uh, in regard to this exploratory research, uh, open science institutions uh, have demonstrated comparative efficiency vis-a-vis um, -vis other modes of organization, and I'll describe them. Um, even though what these set of institutions are is a co very complex uh, system uh, formed of informal no norms uh, developed within the research communities, and that means that there is not one set of standard norms, but the set of variants of norms which are adapted to the needs of particular scientific domains and the cultures in which those have been more fully elaborated. Thank you. So these are the practices which are associated with what I continue to call uh, open science. Open science is not simply a tool set. It is a set of organizational forms and institutionalized practices which are embedded in a larger society uh, and therefore uh, are adapted uh, to other features of that society with, with, uh, upon which they depend in some cases and against which they struggle in other cases. There are some implications uh, of that uh, regarding the way in which it is possible to transform these institutions without disrupting them to the point that they lose their functional uh, capabilities, particularly their unique ones. The self-organized collective creativity of open science uh, has, as I will argue, been very important in the way in which the communities working, largely those communities based in academic institutions, uh, but some, some cases in, gov in government uh, and private, uh, the private institute of research, the way they have responded to modern uh, set of re relatively recent external threats. Uh, and this response uh, and creativity in the formation of this institutional structure, uh, not necessarily as a purposeful plan, but as a self-organized and evolving process, uh, is as important in recent times as it was in the origins of these institutions. Okay? Um, and that is an interesting feature in that the capability, if you like, of, the, of a, a social groups at a, the point of the emergence and initial stabilization of the set of practices which is called open science, historically has not been a capability which has been lost uh, in the subsequent development and the elaboration of these institutions, even though the process of institutionalization often uh, can, be, uh, can be crippling uh, to creativity and to the ability uh, to introduce uh, in important uh, changes uh, which, are, which preserve uh, uh, the, the practice. Okay? So this is, uh, if you like, a happy, a happy history of something which arose uh, as you'll see uh, with re in a rather spontaneous uh, reaction to a past set of circumstances, but which was not lost in the process of its institutionalization. The universalist and collectivist pursuit of scientific knowledge, uh, self-organized by the respective research communities, resonates much more strongly with the ethos of the early Renaissance's public, uh, republic of letters than with the metaphorical notion of the market for ideas, uh, which means that a lot of initial analysis by economists who try to use the market paradigm to understand the allocation of resources uh, within 
uh, open science were misled uh, by uh, picking the wrong metaphor, uh, which is surprising in a sense uh, that, as I will argue and show you, that modern economics uh, has one of its tenets in the development of an economics of information has shown that, e that information, which is what is produced uh, by scientific research and what scientific research uses as an input for further production, that information is not a normal commodity. It's a commodity uh, which is allocated, which can, is not allocated efficiently by market pro by market competitive market processes. So the view I will present is of open science as belonging to a larger class of decentralized, distributed, non-market systems of knowledge pro and information production uh, and distribution you know, that are important, intricate, interesting, uh, but only recently have begun to be studied uh, by economists uh, in a movement which was called uh, the New Economics of Science movement, which I had a part uh, yeah, in, in launching uh, in the late 70s. So open science is then a comparatively efficient but hardly perfect system of resource allocation for production producing reliable new knowledge, but uh, it does perform comparatively poorly in the task of capturing the social surpluses or the, the, the beneficial uh, results of the new knowledge uh, in, the exploitates, uh, in the exploitation of existing knowledge. It does well in the generation and in the continuing advance uh, of uh, scientific understanding and uh, the foundations for technological advance, you know, but it does not translate these into immediately uh, and naturally into the solution of, so of society's problems. Other mechanisms are required uh, for, uh, for, the, for that purpose. One of the principal mechanisms is through the interaction between the regime of open science and pr the pr proprietary R&D research regime uh, at the macro level, that is, at the macro institutional level, not within a given organization, but in the larger system in which it is bedded, embedded, it is uh, market systems which are responsive at some levels, not perfectly, to social needs, but also can be responsible to signals you know, from uh, a from governments which are enlightened and attempt to correct uh, the malallocation of resources arising from private interest as distinct uh, from uh, mechanisms through which uh, public interest can be expressed uh, and signaled uh, through, through the market by intervention in the market processes. But it is, in the end, the, the private system sort of mo motivated by private gains which is, turns out to be more responsive and more externally uh, influenced by feedback from what people want, expressed either through their, through their, gover through their government representatives uh, and a representative state or uh, through uh, the workings of, of competitive markets. So this interaction is one in which you can see the two systems functioning in a, as complements. If uh, they are kept in appropriate balance with one another, maintaining that balance is, as I say on the text, the central science and technology policy challenge for modern economists. Uh, uh, and it, and it is, it is a, a continuous and persisting challenge. It's not amenable to a one time to a one time fix because within both of each of the subsystems there are uh, changes and differences which disturb their, their relationship. And so the case of, of rebalancing uh, is, a, is a continual role uh, for, uh, for science and technology policy, uh, one which is often not uh, recognized and which the political process is not very 
uh, is not very good for because the payoffs to this are really in the long term, in terms of long term progress. Uh, in, in the short run, uh, the imbalances may turn out to serve the needs of, of both private interest or the political or the political uh, class, uh, uh, who who generally have a very short time horizon, uh, which uh, lasts uh, f from their their assured term in office or their chance of being returned uh, to, uh, to, poli to political positions. But finally, open science, like other cooperative institutional arrangements, uh, is fragile in, uh, in its performance. It is dependent upon external support. Uh, uh, and hence, the overall performance of the research system in modern economies itself uh, is uh, at risk if the fragile character of one of its important subsystems, the open science system, is not protected and defended uh, from things which would degrade its performance and therefore degrade the long-term performance of the system as a whole. So this is a very strong motivation to try to uh, spread an understanding of this system uh, even to people who are working within it uh, and who see it within a particular institutional setting. In a particular institutional setting, the things I have said about the complementarity of the two uh, systems, the proprietary system and the open science system, uh, does not manifest itself because they are competitive for resources and a system driven uh, by uh, pr private interests as opposed uh, to the cooperative uh, impulse and to collaborative uh, work is much more readily undermined by competition from resources uh, from from the other system uh, and so uh, and it has uh, it doesn't have uh, the, the rapid uh, capability of mobilizing resources in part because it is dependent upon uh, for support from the outside since the terms of its existence and its special qualities do not allow it uh, to uh, generate uh, new resources by uh, selling access uh, to the knowledge which it generates, which, which it produces. It does not capture the ben a large portion for itself of the benefits, and therefore it does not create a, a, a stock of uh, financial assets or others which can be used to mobilize uh, defense against competitive attack from outside as a large corporation uh, would. So putting the two systems within one institution is a prescription to have them degrade each other's performance and get a system which is sub, uh, suboptimal, which in a, in a line is why is the, the rationale for the defense against the introduction of commercialization into an institution like academia academic institutions or public research institutions. Because what you get is, is, a, is a combination, not a useful hybrid like a mule, uh, but something which performs worse uh, than either of the subsystems separately. So if you can come away with, with that, set, uh, that set of ideas fr from this talk, uh, uh, you, will, you will have everything which it took me a long time to work out uh, for myself. Uh, as to why I was doing this and why it was important. Okay. So now we will we can regress uh, uh, to uh, to uh, uh, what is the supporting framework of ideas, um, uh, which uh, which give uh, which give some uh, underpinnings uh, to the arguments that I've made uh, about uh, the organization of research. So we start with the peculiarity uh, of information, which holds the key, in a sense, to why uh, we have different institutions and, and modes for organizing research activity in modern societies. Okay? Um, now, the typical economist a historical answer to this um, uh, for, the, for the case for publicly funded open science uh, goes as follows uh, in, in compressed form. Uh, so as I've said, information, which is the key input, as well as the output, 
of research has public goods properties. The public goods properties are not the properties of things which are produced in the public se sector. They may be the rationale for the fact that they are produced in the public sector, but they are not definitionally uh, what is done in the public sector. Public goods properties consist of three attributes. Uh, the first uh, I like to call uh, infinite expansibility. In other words, the marginal cost of transferring information uh, to another party uh, is negligible in comparison to the cost of its production. It is characterized by high costs of the first copy and, and diminishing marginal cost, incremental cost of producing other copies. Secondly, these kinds of goods are characterized by a high degree of indivisibility. In other words, I can't produce a very small amount of an idea. An idea is an integral. Uh, it's an integral thing. It may have different parts, but each one of them are integral. So you can build something larger from some component. But each of the com constituent elements is itself uh, integral. Uh, and that means that it does not have a pr the, pro the superadditivity pro property which characterizes ordinary commodities. If I have a one lump of coal and I give, get another lump of coal, which is essentially chemically identical to it, I have two lumps of coal. If I have one idea, okay, uh, some, let's take something something which is operational, algorithmic. I, I understand how, how to calculate uh, a, a derivative uh, uh, of a function, okay? And somebody comes in and tells me the same thing again, okay? I don't have two ideas. I still have one idea, okay? So the com constituent pieces of the information uh, are, heterog are heterogeneous, if they are recognizably different than they really are, not the same thing, so that they are not the standard commodity, which is produced many lumps of coal, many, uh, many ears of corn, uh, they are different. Uh, and they have all have first costs, which are, high in, which are high in relationship to the ability to disseminate uh, this, that the marginal cost of dissemination is very large. For the the third property is that it takes some substantial resource cost to prevent uh, others uh, from uh, having access uh, to this uh, information. Okay? Um, it frequently, information about something uh, like a, a process, uh, a recipe, uh, becomes divulged by simply performing it. Okay? Knowledge of the process streaks out. Things can be reverse engineered uh, once you see how, uh, you know, what it does. You can think of taking it apart and figuring out uh, what are the principles that allowed it to do it. Or if I want to give you the recipe for something, uh, a new uh, tasty product or one which is slightly uh, addictive, uh, such as uh, Coca-Cola, the original drink, had a, had, a, had a good bit of cocaine in it, uh, uh, or cocaine derivatives. Uh, it was sold as a syrup, and it was distributed uh, at uh, soda fountains uh, in which uh, people mixed the syrup uh, in, a, in a glass uh, with sparkling water, with a carbonated water. Okay. So you know, somebody had an idea for greatly improving this product, but the problem was to figure out how uh, to be rewarded for the idea. So you approach, you, you approach the person and say, I've got a fantastic idea. It will be worth thousands, millions for you. Uh, and if you pay me this amount of money, which is not very large in relationship to its total benefits, I'll give it to you. And the person says, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, well, tell me what it is. And they say, no, I don't want to tell you what it is because if I tell you what it is, uh, you'll know. You'll know enough. Okay. Uh, 
So the, uh, this is called in economics a transactional externality. That is to say, the act of transacting in uh, the commodity itself confers benefit for the person who has yet to pay for it, okay? Entering into the transaction. Uh, in the case of Coca-Cola, uh, there, there was a real transaction uh, in which the uh, person says, uh, I will write my idea on a piece of paper, okay? And uh, it, will be, it will be deposited and you, you can look at it, uh, but you have to leave the piece of paper there as evidence then I let you look at it, uh, and uh, if you use this, you will pay me this amount, which I want you to put on in bond, okay? You have to deposit it with a piece of paper in this secure place, all right? And so the deal was affected, uh, and this formula, which is still kept as a trade secret today by Coca-Cola company, uh, consisted of two words on a piece of paper. Does anybody know what the two words are? Well, you can translate it into Portuguese, but in English, it's bottle it, <laughs> okay? Put it in a bottle already mixed, right? This, this was a, a, a major commercial breakthrough. Okay. Okay. This idea about information and public goods is not new. Uh, one of the famous, uh, I'm a great fan of Thomas Jefferson uh, as, a, as an intellect. Uh, all intellects and all people have, have their, uh, their drawbacks. And uh, he, was a, he was an exceptional man of his age. Uh, and he, uh, in, keeping, in keeping slaves and so forth, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was no, uh, no better and no worse than many other slaveholders. In fact, he was on average uh, better. But what he said uh, uh, pointed out uh, that, uh, I won't read the whole quote, you can read it yourself, but he, he pointed out in the, in the part that's underlined, he says, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine. This is the notion that he, the thing that's special about ideas is that they can be simultaneously used without exhausting them. Okay? You don't use up my ability to take derivatives uh, by, uh, uh, by doing it yourself with the information I've given you, okay? Uh, he receives light without darkening me. And I, I like the second part of the metaphor. He says that ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man. And the improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature when she made them like fire expansible over all space without lessening their density at any point, and like the air in which we freely move and have our physical being incapable of confinement and exclusive appropriation. Okay. These principles, which uh, uh, were in a letter uh, to an inventor in 1813, uh, in which he was trying to persuade the inventor uh, that there was no natural right uh, to be able to possess information uh, and monopolize it by a patent. That that was a matter of state, <coughs> uh, state policy, uh, and it may have its uses, but the natural rights argument, which followers of Locke uh, uh, were, were pushing, uh, did not give any justification uh, for that. So people who were denied a patent were not denied any, uh, any, uh, any natural right. And these are exactly the terms that came quite independently to be articulated uh, uh, in the modern, uh, in modern uh, information economics, uh, first by uh, Kenneth Arrow, a colleague of mine at, at Stanford, uh, and, a, and a Nobel Prize reci recipient uh, for that and, and many other contributions. So the economic implications are that competitive markets fail to allocate public goods efficiently due to the transactional externality and due to the possibility of free riding, uh, that you provide it uh, and hope people will pay, uh, but if people can, uh, can use it and get it from someone else, since it costs them nothing uh, to share the idea, it doesn't diminish uh, their use of it, uh, so free riding 
uh, is very uh, is very easy, and you have to take uh, elaborate steps you know, to keep something uh, secret. Competitive pricing, at which will be at incremental cost, at incremental marginal cost, uh, will essentially price this commodity at negligible cost for the marginal, the cost of providing the marginal unit, in which case you cannot recoup the first cost uh, unless you have some other kind of arrangement. Uh, and so external, the external use benefits of such goods do not, uh, are not going to be properly valued by the willingness of private parties to pay for it. And in this case, the argument is that public goods need to be uh, collectively uh, funded uh, through an apparatus like a tax system, uh, which then allocates resources, or uh, in which a, a government entity uh, borrows on the strength of its credit in order to provide uh, public infrastructure, uh, public health services, and so forth. Uh, so so the, there's an entire structure which is very important in the economics of public finance, uh, which has worked through all of this, but it's taken a long time before this, uh, uh, this uh, analysis came to be applied to understand the workings of research uh, organizations, right? which dealt in information. The classic analysis uh, suggests uh, three uh, mechanisms, tax finance subsidies for producing public good like uh, water, lighting, utility, some transport, transport services. So you, uh, you subsidize the activity through general taxes, you or you create a monopoly, a state-created monopoly, and allow the monopolist uh, to collect uh, a profit uh, by charging more than the actual marginal cost for railway tickets or for uh, uh, consignments uh, shipped uh, as cargo. Or uh, you actually have the state produce provide the service. In other words, it is not a private railway, it's a state railway, the state produces it. Or you have government research labs. So the corresponding identity, which I, I call the three Ps, are the coexisting in solution, institutional solutions to the problem proposed by information goods. And these are patronage, okay, and the open science reward system is a devolved system of patronage in representative governments uh, through which the public is, becomes the patron, but it's, uh, it has the state acting as its agent, uh, in essentially collecting uh, taxes, uh, revenue, uh, which is then used uh, to, uh, to get, uh, to patronize, uh, provide support for others who will produce uh, this uh, public good or property, which is a market solution, but it's not the free market solution because what it does is create the monopoly, okay? And the monopoly takes the form of intellectual property monopolies, which allow the monopoly holders uh, to extract uh, a, a surplus uh, from, the, from the users. The effects of, the sur of this surplus extraction will limit as everybody, I think, understands, the access uh, to this. Uh, it will financially limit it, or uh, in, in order to be sure that people uh, do not avoid paying uh, the, the high markup uh, to get uh, the journal article, uh, people resort uh, to legal systems to enforce uh, the, monopoly, the monopoly right, or they think about uh, technological systems uh, so, you know, such as uh, uh, what, you know, what, what are called uh, sort of DM, DMR, uh, for the, which is you know, intellectual, intellectual property management uh, systems, uh, which, which are a, a technological enforcement, uh, which can be introduced even if you have no right to protect it. Once you, once you do it, this is sometimes called self-help, uh, that you, you manage, you put something behind an encrypted wall uh, and then uh, you allow people uh, to enter through the wall, but you charge them uh, what the traffic will bear. Okay, so one can recognize this in the in the marketing practices of, of certain uh, scientific journals. Uh, 
or a procurement policy, which is the state uh, runs the production uh, or, so, uh, uh, or sources this, but the state manages the production activity. So we see, we see this. And so systems uh, in, in the modern world uh, use each of these different devices because they each have some pros and cons, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go uh, into, into all, of, uh, into all of, of the details, but uh, there, was a period, there was a period of time in which each of these had been developed sufficiently, sometimes uh, more in one country than in another, uh, but they all could see the other models and see where it might be useful, uh, and so uh, what you have in the simplex diagram is a, a sense that there is some balance. This is a, more or less an equal, an equal balance of using these techniques for different, uh, for different uh, kinds of research activities uh, and funding them that way. So now the question is, what is special about uh, the open science mode of organizing research which justifies its support? So it's, as I've argued, especially functional in promoting rapid accumulation process uh, for advancing uh, reliable knowledge. Okay? And it does this through a, diff a series of different aspects. It has, starts with a collegiate reputational reward structure, which provides incentives and signals for agents' efforts uh, and their allocation decisions. That is, the, the peer representation, the collegiate representational reward system ties uh, your access to the resources to do research as well as uh, to, uh, to, earn, to earn a living to uh, the reputation that you acquire uh, by virtue of your performance of this activity in the eyes of the research community. Okay. This is in turn based on the principle of priority uh, of discovery, uh, and a claim to have been first. And one can see uh, that this, uh, uh, th this system is, uh, is almost necessitated by uh, the property of information. Uh, because uh, suppose uh, we, we have a new, uh, a new idea, a new uh, technique, uh, which uh, is produced by, uh, you know, by uh, Rachel uh, and, uh, and Sophie appears and say, no, I actually thought of this. I worked this all out in the bath the other night or two, three weeks ago. In fact, it was two, it was two months ago, long before, the, before this paper appeared. And so the question is, well, should we reward Sophie for this? Well, the answer is, what we care about, it's making it public, okay? Now we care about making it public because that's a good in itself, disclosure, but it's the only way that we can ascertain who did it first, okay? So this is an incentive to publish uh, um, more quickly uh, if you can. Sometimes it creates an incentive to publish too quickly, okay? All right, so this is the, this is, this is the problem. It's the, that the components of this system um, fit together in one state, but they can also produce side effects which are not, uh, uh, not so desirable. Now, that's the last point on the slide. Uh, this is a term of art among economists, incentive compatibility. Incentive compatibility uh, refers to the idea that the incentive structure actually incentivizes something that people are going to find natural and aligned with their own interests, okay? Now, even though the ins incentive structure it occurs from outside, but it's, if you like, it's one that works for them. And not all incentives uh, are like that. So the problem, the problem is uh, that in the early stages, people possess different information, okay? If you've worked on something in the lab, you know a lot more about it than the director of the lab or the head of the company uh, or, uh, or, your, or a fellow scientist. And so the question is, so you have this um, problem. Uh, you can't really monitor the 
a contribution of somebody by clocking up how many hours uh, they have spent uh, in the lab. Okay, because a lot of my friends, particularly in, in physics uh, and in mathematics, say that they do most of their serious work in the bathtub. Okay, it's those moments when they're relaxed or their mind clears that they always get. You know, they figure out what it is that they that they have been working on that they can really go ahead with. Okay, so we would have to have a way of monitoring people in the shower or in, I, I actually. I don't do very well in the bath. I tend to relax and fall asleep. But in the shower is, is where I, uh, that's where I, where, where I can think. Uh, so uh, the, the reward, the, you create an incentive in which the reward for rapid disclosure, which gives you a better chance in the claim for priority, is what elicits uh, the public uh, good of releasing this and make it, making it available uh, for, uh, for others. Uh, to do various uh, various things with, uh, try to use it, and in the, that process validate the claim. Okay, find out uh, if it has any uh, adverse side effects, uh, uh, which have not been thought of by the expender. Depending upon changing changing the circumstances in which it's used, uh, may lead something that works positively in one situation to produce something uh, which is noxious in a, in another. Uh, and so people's, the, vi the variation in uses uh, will uh, eventually un uncover these bugs, okay? And so I, I'll give you the, the reference because a lot of people are more familiar with, so with software than they are with things that, that go on in labs, okay? So, so then we come to these propositions which I referred to is that open science is suited for maximizing the growth of the stock of re reliable knowledge whereas proprietary research is suited better for maximizing the volume of economic rents, that is to say social surplus, extracted from the existing stock. Okay. The problematic aspects of the performance of the, private, of the proprietary system uh, lie often in uh, the effort uh, to get reward leads to the overpricing, that is to say excess pricing above cost which in turn deters uh, people's access uh, when uh, there is not a competitive market, which will drive down, uh, compete away uh, the excess, uh, the excess profit. So, uh, and this gives rise to the superior efficiency. Okay. And this is reiterates the point that I've made you know, that uh, combining uh, the two systems within a single institution. Is a, pres is a prescription uh, for making each of them function worse because now you have two reward systems uh, where you can get rewarded in the university for your patenting activity uh, and for keeping your work secret in your lab, for closing your lab, for telling your graduate students that they can't talk to anybody else uh, who isn't working on the project, for, for not discussing your work with your colleagues. In other words, shutting down the information flow which would enhance the research process, possibly, okay, uh, and would uh, allow dissemination of techniques and procedures which could be improved by other people's suggestion, okay? Uh, so that's one set of incentives. Uh, and then the other is to collaborate and to work, uh, to work in a cooperative fashion, uh, okay? So you get an incentive to the extent that you are your colleagues say it's a, this person is a very useful person to have in our department. May not be the first name on the papers, but she has actually done all of the difficult work uh, with reagents, uh, so, or she has kept the cell lines alive. We couldn't have done any of this work without her, even though she, you know, she, is, not, she is not recognized as the person who generated the project, but terribly useful. So this kind of structure and reward system can be, uh, again, it's in the interest of people in the work group to reward productive members of the group, even though in terms of their uh, visibility from outside, uh, from people who are not involved in the production process and only care about the output, uh, you'll get, uh, you get a, different, a different answer. Right? Uh, so th this, uh, th th these reward systems uh, have different 
give you different results. And if you put them both into the same organization, what you get is a lot of organizational confusion and, and ambiguity. Uh, and, and one can see that, uh, that private corporations do not mix incentive structure. They do not mix hiring principles. If you are going to hire people on a meritocratic basis, you can't promote them on the basis of their, uh, of their actual uh, re relationship through marriage uh, or heredity uh, with, other, with other members of the organization who are in, a, in the hierarchy, okay? And similarly, uh, for if, you, if, you, if you are very meritocratic inside uh, and you are keeping people outside uh, for ascriptive or other reasons, which are not correlated with their ability, uh, then people say, well, you're managing, you're, you sort of have a meritocratic system, but you're managing the intake in a way that's biased and which will favor the advancement of certain people, okay? So these, these conflicts within organizations are a subject which organizational uh, sociology, psychology, and research management deals with within, uh, within entities, okay? And the question is, okay, uh, so the restraints is there are not ones which you, which the university administrations have any ex experience with, uh, and they have themselves mixed motives, and so that leads to that leads to problems. Okay, so let me do move more quickly because I think this may be more familiar. Familiar uh, doesn't come from economics; it comes really from the early sociology of science, uh, defined by uh, Robert Merton uh, and his students. And uh, focused in, uh, first, in this case, on the ethos and norms and the institutions which distinguish the Republic of Open Science, uh, uh, and gave an answer to the to the reasons as to why you have different organizational regimes. Uh, but they posed the question as to how such a strange system could arise uh, in a circumstance which it, in which it did, which it arose from a world of secret knowledge and the secret of hunt. For nature's, uh, for nature's secret, uh, and ambiguity about the dis disclosure of new knowledge to the hoi polloi, uh, so that this was the province of elites uh, who, uh, who could be uh, needed, uh, needed to be uh, those who uh, made decisions about what could, what could be safely released. Uh, and the more powerful and potent the knowledge was, uh, the greater caution. John Simon, a physicist who became a philosopher uh, of science uh, and, and a, a, stu a student of sociology of science, uh, came up with, with a very nice uh, uh, mnemonic, uh, which is based on the idea of uh, kudos, uh, rec uh, recognition uh, 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 for distinction uh, and, and congratulation, uh, to remember Key, the key uh, norms of cooperation, uh, universalism, which is essentially open access, that anyone who can, anyone who's qualified to do, to make the practice, no matter where they come from and what their social standing is and uh, what their, what, what their, uh, their, their ethnic or uh, religious identity, anyone should be allowed uh, to practice. universal activity. Disinterestedness does not mean that you're disinterested in the research, but you have no other interest in the outcome. You, know, you don't have a pre a, a, a preformed notion of what is what will be the right answer uh, in terms which derives not from your scientific intuition, but derives from how an answer to the question as to will benefit you or others uh, who are in a power relationship to you. Now, openness, I think we've, uh, we've, ha we've had, uh, have talked about. And the last one is related to one of the benefits uh, of open disclosure, uh, which is that it permits the exercise of skepticism. Okay? That it took something uh, in the world in which open science emerged uh, for you to question uh, a claim by someone that you had, dis that you had discovered something that was original or interesting or a new phenomenon. It 
to express doubt, uh, you were in some sense uh, saying, I don't believe you, okay? Uh, the demand to have it demonstrated produced uh, serious problems in a hierarchical society uh, where people are from lower social orders did not sort of question uh, uh, the, uh, the work. This was a matter of honor. People, you know, people were subjected to, uh, if they were re reasonably equal, they were subjected to challenges of, to, to, if, uh, to satisfy the other person whose honor had been, uh, had been impeached uh, by having doubt expressed. So uh, this, uh, this gives you uh, another set of idealized socialized norms and their, fu and their functional uh, role uh, within, uh, within this, uh, the, uh, the system. Uh, and uh, from this comes a set of stylized procedural arrangements which have come to be increasingly uh, institu institutionalized or formally institutionalized. This should say substantial autonomy of individuals in agenda control and the design and conduct of research. Uh, and this goes with responsibility for the research, for the conduct of the research, uh, and uh, the need for validation of a claim to have made a scientific uh, contribution and therefore to be qualified for the reward. So uh, this uh, diagram, for those people who like figures and get the sense of everything uh, from having it schematically, it shows the degree of interdependence of the different elements uh, of, the, of the process of the rapid accumulation of knowledge, uh, which uh, are uh, interlocked because they work, they work together. So that disclosure norms, rapid disclosure and therefore rapid access to others is connected uh, as an outcome of priority races, okay, which in turn comes from you know, the reward system, okay, which is from the viewpoint of the individual. Uh, so the, the norms instruct uh, racing, racing for priority and disclosure, which then leads to publication pr uh, processes, uh, and the publication processes support uh, the, uh, supposed to support the, re the reward system. Uh, and the validation which flows from that disclosure feeds uh, not only new knowledge, but more reliable knowledge, okay? Reliable knowledge on which others can, uh, can build. So let me just uh, 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 flag uh, uh, things without going into them to, to say that I have not idealized this in, uh, system in order uh, to say that it's a perfect system. Uh, it was Many of the defects of the system have been long recognized, and there have been you know, various efforts and proposals to change them. Uh, in a recent uh, exam re-examination of people who have a vision of changing the system, uh, they, uh, they often say that this, you know, by, do by doing away with a large part of the system, we'll do away with its inefficiencies, yes, but you will also do away with the system. And then you will ask, well, what is it that you will reconstruct that will have that will be able to simulate many of the functional features of the system without bringing uh, back these inefficiencies. So the attack on inefficiency calls for a more, a more sophisticated uh, set of solutions uh, which, are, uh, which are taken and framed within the more complicated system of, if you like, different component parts which we have to work together. So priority-based rewards creates a conflict between incentives to compete and the norms of cooperation and openness, okay? And this is typically is uh, resolved by sort of dynamic switching uh, in modern times. The same person uh, who is working in a lab in an open science mode uh, sets up across the street uh, a startup. Uh, and in the startup, uh, everything is secret. Uh, uh, people are uh, forced to uh, leave their notebooks in the end of the at, at the end of, of the day, uh, they if if you can uh, put restrictions on their ability to work in the same industry uh, or in the same uh, in the same region in the same industry, uh, you do so. Uh, so uh, and then and then uh, the payment structure uh, is uh, is conditioned on the payoff to the firm. Okay. 
Uh, and then we have all kinds of distributional rules. Uh, and then they switch back and they come back into their, into their lab and try to operate leaving that mode of management behind. Okay? Uh, and there are lots of, uh, of, of obvious conflicts in which people uh, use research assistants uh, in, a pri in, a, in, a, in a private uh, for-profit business which is not beneficial in their role as the supervisor of the person's uh, research, okay? or that they restrict the kind of research that the person uh, is doing, or they channel them to do research uh, on something which will support uh, the interests of the firm, uh, promising that that will lead. Uh, if they can't get an academic position, then they will be able to work for the firm. So th this is a sort of the, the corruption of one of their roles because of their conflict of interest. So they are not, they're not only disinterested in the answer, they are also, uh, they don't have disinterest in the process. Right? Okay. Peer interest affects the expected size of rewards, uh, and, and this induces herding, excess concentration of effort on particular topics. So hot topics uh, which, in which the people are contributing, are getting a lot of attention, lead more people to come into the field. This leads to uh, ex excess concentration uh, of resources on solving certain problems which, which are only important because they have been deemed important. So this is the uh, manifestation of uh, famous for being famous. Okay. And so this is a positive feedback system which can lead to gross distortions. These, most of these uh, look like bubbles uh, and they eventually last. Everybody, you know, Either the thing is solved, or it turns out to, to be not so interesting, and the, everybody leaves, and you know, the herd goes someplace else. Okay. And one sees this uh, if you if you if you read uh, people who monitor uh, which which are the hundred hottest papers and so forth. Okay. They're relatively short lived. Tournament-like payoff structures induces wasteful, inefficient, inefficient racing behavior. A tournament structure is where the winner takes most of the prize, okay? So if you're five minutes ahead of, uh, of somebody at the patent office and it's first to file rules, uh, there's no pay nothing for the second person who comes. Similarly, uh, there is a tournament-like payoff in getting your paper into uh, pub a public journal, a published journal, a published journal of a particular rank in the payoff structure. Uh, uh, so that leads, again, uh, to inefficient race. From a society's viewpoint, uh, we don't really care you know, whether the solution uh, to, let's say, the location uh, of the uh, BR, uh, BR1 uh, and 2, the breast cancer, uh, the, uh, the gene which uh, disposes, predisposes the breast, fat, breast cancer uh, is on this part or that part of, the, of a particular chromosome three days earlier, okay? The amount of that difference in time in terms of social benefit is negligible. But for the career of the researchers, it's terribly important. The payoff is very large. And that disproportionate thing leads to inefficient, uh, inefficiency in that people will sacrifice uh, resource expenditures in, for speed, for speed, because what for them is payoff is speed. Society cares that it gets done in timely fashion, uh, but usually the waste occurs in the very last phases uh, where you are really throwing every resource that you have to try to get, uh, get the result out before somebody else does. Positive feedback from reputation effects, uh, which give people differential access to research inputs, leads to what's called path dependence in career dynamics. That is, if you are lucky enough to publish a paper which is answers a, a problem which a number of people are interested in, even though, yes, even though you were not, uh, uh, didn't require great brilliance. Your career is off to a flying start, and then uh, your second paper would really be probably ignored, except that you now have sufficient grant funding to attract uh, better graduate students, uh, uh, 
uh, you can have more people on your research team, you have better equipment, you can move to a better university which has a better record and site evaluations, and so your second paper uh, thus it isn't uh, like the second novel which falls well below the first, you can keep that standard. And then you become trapped uh, by your past reputation, so you have to work harder, you know, which explains a well-known uh, psychological phenomena uh, that is, as scientists become more and more established, you know, they complain of the amount of work uh, which they are having to do and the fact that they are over overburdened uh, with work. And that was even before uh, funding cutbacks required people to be writing overlapping grant, grant proposals all the time. Okay. Um, so this is, well, this ph phenomena uh, is uh, called the Matthew Effect in the famous paper by, how many people have heard this phrase, the Matthew Effect? Okay, so, okay, that's, okay, people in science uh, have come across this. And the reference is to, to uh, uh, Matthew, the book of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, uh, by the way, uh, and the view is uh, Matthew sort of uh, said, uh, to those who have, more shall be given. And to those who have not, even the little that they have uh, will be t shall be taken or will be taken away. Okay, so this is uh, th this is what uh, positive feedback will do. And finally, public patronage means that societal needs has to be translated into government science policy by a political process, which creates more scope for private interest uh, to get into this uh, into this problem, uh, you know, because the scientific. Uh, activity is not able to implement, uh, not able to implement and exploit the technique. Uh, it's, not, it's not equipped for, and the systems that they would have to, uh, that they would have to get in to compete competitively in the market uh, would be at variance uh, with the other system. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, on, uh, on this, uh, other, other than to, uh, to briefly, uh, there, there's a lot of work in here, and there's a very long paper uh, which you can get. Uh, uh, the, the point here is that open science emerged more or less coinci uh, coincidentally in time uh, with uh, the uh, epistemological revolution uh, in science at the beginning of the 17th, uh, late, late 16th, early 17th century. And the epistemological revolution is concerned uh, with the fusion of mathematics and experiment experimentalism. Uh, which came from much uh, deeper, deeper trans, uh, trans, uh, uh, traditions uh, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and we are familiar with uh, both the, the, the pioneers uh, of the scientific revolution in Galileo, Kepler, and Descartes, uh, the se and the second generation uh, was more famous in uh, mechanical and experimental uh, natural philosophers, the Boyd, Newton, these people, uh, uh, Boyd and Newton in particular, uh, were lived in both worlds. They lived in the world of secrets and alchemy, uh, and in the world of open uh, publication and scientific societies. Uh, uh, and uh, their uh, their their engagement uh, in this other world, uh, the hidden world, uh, uh, is. Uh, was uh, was uh, ex extensive, but they were part. You know, the the alchemical tradition had had deep medieval roots, uh, and what alchemists were hunting for was health, wealth, and power. Uh, they had an instrumental approach to the search for knowledge uh, by experimental methods, uh, uh, the, and the practice was developed uh, into quite sophisticated forms of chemical alchemy. In the, in the 17th century, to which uh, Newton uh, and Boyle, particularly in London, uh, were uh, contributing in these closed circles uh, of alchemists. Uh, but they lived in a society in which craft guild constrict, uh, restrictions preserved the mysteries of the trade, maps were kept, uh, were kept secret. Uh, uh, this is a slide on Newton uh, from uh, Cambridge uh, King's College Library, which has Newton's manuscripts, uh, Newton uh, wrote more words devoted to alchemy than to any of his scientific writings. And people are telling me I'm devoting more time to this than I, uh, than I should do. Uh, so uh, in, a, in a word, 
the problem of facing these people uh, at this time was that the patronage system on which they depended uh, was less interested uh, in the content of what they were doing than in the prestige that came from having somebody who was known as a, 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 wi a very a wise uh, and able person, uh, a, a magus, somebody who could do uh, important things and who actually had practical knowledge, which is uh, useful. In, des in designing castles, in armaments, in irrigation, and things like that. Uh, they were not interested so much in the science and where this knowledge came from, uh, and, but they were also interested in having this, this kind of person adorn their court, okay? Uh, and so the, the question was, how were they able to evaluate who was a good person or not a good person or a useful person for them to patronize? So in a short term, kind of a, a more complicated process, what happened was that the people who are competing for patronage jobs figured out that uh, if being famous was important, uh, then what they had to do was to establish their fame among non-patrons, among the people who the patrons would consult. And the patrons would consult the people who they were patronizing. They would say, you heard of this person's work. And so they began to openly com com both correspond with people, for telling them about what they had done, telling them of, of discoveries that, they had, uh, that had been made and proofs that they had. Uh, they told them about competitions which they had won. Okay. And in that way, they began uh, to uh, create the notion that there was a peer reference group and you had to, exp you had to share with them your knowledge in order uh, to attract the kind of patronage uh, and support that you needed to go on with your work. So this is uh, one of these uh, uh, examples of uh, Adam Smith uh, in which a private vice uh, turn your competition for patronage turns into a public virtue uh, in which you, you, you have to uh, expose what you're doing uh, to other experts so that they can validate for some, a third party that you are uh, that you will be recognized as prince for having this person in your court okay uh, and the the, the uh, working working through how this system worked and working out the point that what was problematic was the use of mathematics because the, the princes could un could understand and evaluate uh, their uh, their artisans who could produce uh, gold and silver uh, objects, and paintings, music, and so forth. But when it came to mathematics, although there were some mathematical princes in Italy, uh, they were not able to deal with algebra, okay, and with the new mathematics. And so open challenges uh, were a way in which people proved uh, that the new methods uh, of the algorithms uh, would turn out to be uh, more superior uh, than those of the abacus. This is, so this is a, uh, okay. Uh, going to go on. This is just an advertisement of things uh, which you can, dishes, dishes that they were not brought to the table, but they're, they're on view, uh, and you can, you'll find them. Okay. Uh, I think most people are familiar with, the, with the, the points that I wanted to make about the challenge which arose from the expansion of public property rights and the, and the shrinkage or the incursions uh, into, the public, into the public domain uh, that were made uh, by the expansion of property rights uh, uh, starting uh, in, uh, in really in, in the, the, late the late 70s and which uh, really accelerated uh, through, uh, through, the, uh, through the 80s uh, and into, into the early 90s. Uh, and there was a, a reaction against this because of the unintended consequences uh, of stronger IPA for public sector research activities. And I think most people are familiar, if not all, all of the details. Uh, somebody who's lived through this uh, uh, with, the gener with the general problem, uh, as they are uh, with, uh, with the, you know, the irony that uh, the, the sources of the new technologies which disrupted and altered the IPR regime and pushed it into new domains, uh, into the digital world, 
uh, actually sort of came back uh, to damage the very groups that were responsible uh, for the new technologies because mainframe and mainframes networks, uh, the World Wide Web, all came out of, science, of natural scientists uh, building new tools to, to, to meet their needs, okay? Uh, and what we had was a lot of uh, bottom-up responses, okay, uh, from the scientific community to defend open science, to find ways uh, in which to protect uh, the, their control over data uh, and their access to data. And some of these uh, were preoccupied people. Uh, and one of them uh, is, the no, is the idea that even though you have works which are subject to patents and to copy or to copyrights, it's possible for workers, for work researchers who need to assemble uh, set tool sets which are privately protected to agree to license them to each other, to cross license them to each other by use of private contract. And this is the notion of the contractual construction of research commons, uh, which, uh, which I and others have been involved in, in creating uh, space or reopening the space that was closed uh, through this. So this is an ex post, uh, an ex post solution, okay? And so uh, there are a number of examples which people are uh, aware of. And now we have further, uh, further uh, tool, tool building uh, and, this, and the, tool, the tool building activity uh, uh, has been inspired by open source. And so I think I come to the end of this. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'll, leave, I'll leave you with the, with the thought that, uh, that uh, uh, open source provided a, par uh, a metaphor, uh, but the me metaphors uh, can, uh, uh, can be used as uh, paradigms. And paradigms uh, are, uh, are beyond metaphors in that they commit you to a style of research. An open, si an open source is not like science. Science is really has characteristics uh, which open source does not. And open source's characteristics and the environment in which it became successful is not one that is generally replicated in the sciences. So one has to be aware that, that trying uh, to uh, take a set of tools and procedures which work in an environment which is not replicated in, uh, in many of the sciences uh, will, will turn out to be either a distortion which will which will di disable uh, some of some sciences. And so you have to, if you're redesigning a system, you really have to start uh, by rethinking the system uh, and design it uh, for the purpose uh, with the tools uh, which will support it. Many of the tools being devised are appropriate uh, for advancing and making scientific operations uh, clearer, but it's not clear that the side conditions which will allow them to be widely used are existing exist, uh, and so a lot more work has to be done. Uh, uh, and uh, from these, uh, from this work, uh, if this is adequately uh, uh, done in ways that do not lead to misapplications, uh, and the hope that you can re-engineer uh, re re an entire organizational and institutional system by providing it with tools. Okay, that you have to do a lot of other things to make sure these tools uh, fit the requirements of the activity, which is not defined in terms of the tool set, then uh, it, it, it will produce good examples which will gather sufficient support to actually undertake the institutional transformations uh, and changes in policy which will be needed. But this is not a quick process, uh, and it's a process that needs the the advice and counsel of people who are working within the communities that have to be shifted uh, uh, rather than coming in from outside, okay? But uh, with doing it the right way opens up a great uh, uh, and exciting prospect uh, uh, if one can avoid uh, the errors. So I thank you and I thank you for your patience. Um, I want to start by uh, apologizing because I'm bringing to the discussion a very Western perspective. Of course, I'm from, I'm from Europe uh, and I work in North America and my research is based in, in Europe and North America, so it's quite different from 
uh, a, a southern uh, perspective, maybe, <coughs> uh, probably, uh, or, or an eastern perspective. Uh, but when I decided to say these this words to, to start this, this conversation, I realized that my, uh, actually my, my talk today is much more geographically narrow than that because I'm going to focus on, on Italy and in particular on my old school, uh, CISA, the International School for Advanced Study, Studies in Trieste. So it's very, uh, if you want, uh, um, a link to my personal experience in a sense, but it's also a, a, case, study that, a case study that I will present uh, which has had global effects and I, I think it will bring to the discussion something broader than, than CISA, the CISA school in Trieste. Um, of course, it's an honor to speak after, after Paul David, which, is, which has uh, brought to us this, uh, this broad and, and very deep view on, on the evolution of open science. And uh, I'm, I'm going to draw a, very, a much smaller picture. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on just, just on one side of the open science spectrum. So as, as uh, uh, Sarita said, open science can, can be considered as, as, a, as an umbrella term that includes several different kinds of practices and processes and, and institutions. And I'm going to focus today in particular on open access and in particular on the, on the birth of open access publishing back in the early 90s. So what the, the, the years that somebody has called the pioneering years of, of online publishing, of online scholarly publishing. Um, Okay, so I wanted to, to start with these questions. So is, is open science revolution or does it represent uh, a rather a continuity of, of processes that have been going, that have been going on for, for centuries now? Um, I think we're in the middle of a sort of an unprecedented re renegotiation of the scientific enterprise. And as we adv advocate for change, as, as it's happening in this, in, uh, ac across this seminar, uh, we, must, we must also take into account the, ro the robustness uh, and even the resistance of the, uh, the scholarly communication system. Uh, so 20 years after the, the, the emergence of the World Wide Web, uh, which was invented by scientists in a scientific institution and created and diffused by, by, by scientific institutions, uh, I think as science is still slow uh, in adapting and, and uh, the evolution of, for example, collective online, online creation. It, does, it doesn't drive it anymore. Uh, so the, the, the innovation in that field is, is rather left to the corporate digital world. Uh, so my, my, my first idea is that, is that maybe at the very least the open science change that we discussed at this seminar uh, might take lots of time and resources in order to establish itself as a new paradigm. Uh, if, if by open science we mean uh, distributed, uh, collective, cooperative, uh, uh, transnational and participatory uh, form of knowledge production. <coughs> So I wanted to, again, to start from the idea that the social contract of sciences is, is, a, is a, in, in a crisis, it experiences an overall crisis. Uh, let's say that the so-called normal science, which, which emerged after, after World War II uh, through, through a social and political agreement, um, is, is, has been in, in, in undergoing a transformation at very least since the 70s. It's, it's a broader transformation, which, which of course includes uh, governance, governance and, and production systems. So I'm talking about the post-industrial society or the so-called information society, the increased role of information and knowledge and communication in, a, in our, in our, in our uh, uh, industrial, industrialized societies. Uh, as, as we know, uh, increased presence of private money in basic research, uh, new governance models, uh, new forms, of increased role for intellectual property rights, uh, uh, technological innovation, which is more mixed with, with basic research. Uh, so the crisis that I, that I point to uh, is both in terms of the results of science, uh, so uh, its, its productivity has, has been questioned, the, 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 its ability to solve global, global problems, I, just wa I, wa I wanna just mention the, the ecological crisis or, the, or, or climate change. But on the other side, there is also uh, a crisis of its moral economy or of its morality. Uh, in, in some fields of science, this is, this is very visible, for example, in the life sciences. Patents on life, the so-called so -called patents on life, the, uh, 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 decreased accountability, uh, increased privatization, increased global inequality, also driven by, by scientific and technological innovation. Um, in this framework, uh, of course, 
the change that open science is bringing to the table is not just te technological. We're not just talking about the new, te new communication technology. This is uh, Paul's, of course, uh, uh, talk, which has, uh, which has explained this uh, much better than, than I could, could ever do. Uh, te technology is a precondition for change, but then social, so societal, uh, economic, and political change are also, are also quite important. So this seminar is hopefully uh, going to be a place where this, this change is discussed, is discussed in all these nuances. Nuances, I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, so one of my, I, one of the ideas that I wanted to present to you is that uh, openness is a sort of a force that remoralizes science during this crisis. Uh, and the cultures of openness are crucial and very powerful in this change. Uh, not only because they provide technical alternatives, so more distributed and maybe more productive way of, of organizing knowledge production, um, but also because they're a source of critique uh, to old models of scientific production. Uh, critique to institutional practices and organization, cri critiques, critique to power dynamics, uh, to monopolies and incumbents. Uh, so open science, do open science does provide a metaphor uh, for change, but it also provides, uh, according to me, uh, a, a new, it sort of makes science moral again. Just an example, uh, synthetic biology, which is explicitly incorporating uh, cultural cultures and practices coming from free software and, and, and hacking in order to present biotech in a new, li in a new light, light from a point of view of its political accountability, its social uh, impact, and so on. Um, so I think that those cultures of openness that, 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 are, that are able to, in, in a way, remoralize science allow uh, us, uh, activists of open science, to seek reform or even rock the boat a little bit uh, by, pos at the very least, by posing new questions and challenges. Uh, per, for example, to, to concentrations of power that are typical of modern science. Um, Uh, so what, what, I, what I want to do tonight is to, is to present uh, in, in, in within, within, this, within this general uh, idea of the, 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 the cultural role of, of openness uh, in, in changing in scientific institutions. Um, I want to try and present and provide a small piece of sort of a genealogy of open science, uh, nothing as, as broad as, as Paul's uh, presentation, of course, but I think that uh, I, I, even though it's, it's a small case study, uh, it, it does highlight the importance of understanding open science from, from, the, from the genealogical viewpoint, so understand how um, openness operates in, in, within, within science and where the scientific enterprise uh, shows more stability and resistance and where uh, change is, more, is, is easier and, and faster. Um, it's a bit unfair maybe to present this case study because it's, uh, uh, it's only, again, one specific side of open science, so open access scholarly communication. Um, because it's based in Italy, even though it has a, it has a global scope, of course. And because it's a, it's a specific disciplinary field, uh, which is a bit exoteric and maybe a bit removed from, for example, development, uh, open development issues that other, other panels are going to discuss, uh, which is particle physics. Um, still, I think that this, this might provide some insight into the, into the, the evolution of open science. Uh, so we're going to talk about high energy physics, so physical research that comes mostly from particle accelerators. Uh, it's a, in a way in a very, a very wealthy discipline. Uh, it has a relationship, as you know, with military uh, technological innovation historically. Um, it's also kind of uh, circumscribed, uh, in, in particular in, in, the, in, the, in the field I'm going to explore today, we're talking about a, a discipline which, which only has a handful of journals. So it's not, we, we don't have 2,000 journals as the life sciences, for example. Um, and then it's interesting because, the, because of, the, of the co evolution of high energy physics and the World Wide Web. So the, the fact that World Wide, World Wide Web was born at, at CERN uh, as, as, a, as a project of communication within. Uh, high energy physics uh, scientist. Uh, it's also interesting because it has a very well, well established form of, of open communication, which is the archive. How many of you are familiar with the archive? 
Okay, so it's, it's a preprint server. It's a, it's a website where since 1991, if I'm not wrong, and even before, and under different names, uh, physicists, not, not, not only them, but also mathematicians and so on, uh, upload their preprints. So those are studies, articles that, are not, that have, haven't been sub submitted for publication yet or haven't been accepted for publication yet. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the, the article is ready, they just upload it to the, to the archive and then it's there in the open and anyone can, can go and read them. Uh, this is different from other disciplines. Uh, so there is already an open system of communication which is well established, which is the, the, way, the, the, media, the medium they use. So it's very common for physicists to uh, wake up, go to the office, quite often they sleep there, actually, uh, uh, and, and for first thing in the morning, check the, the archive for, the, for their own sub-discipline, uh, new, new stuff which is coming up. And it contains, I think, at this point, millions of articles. Is that right? Is anybody? Millions. Oh yeah, and this is from a few months ago, so maybe we're getting there. <laughs> I was close though. <coughs> uh, okay, so any initiative in, in, in scholarly public, public, pub, publication in particle physics, of course, is, is in relationship with, with the archive, of course. It's also interesting because th there is a flagship uh, uh, project, open access project, which is the Scope 3, cons the Scope 3 project. It's a sponsoring consortium for open access publishing in particle physics. Uh, it's, it's, it's been operating since January 1st this year, and basically the major institutions uh, that represent f particle physics research uh, and energy physics research, uh, particle physics research, are, 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 have switched the field almost completely. So now the, the whole, the, uh, more than 80% of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the articles that, that are published right now, that, that, will, that will, will be published in the next years, will be right away uh, open access because basically they, they, they asked, they involved uh, even commercial publishers and, and, the, and all, all kind of the, the, the most important journals of the discipline in this scheme, which is basically a, a different way of allocating resources. So the consortium gets the money from those, those institutions in those countries, uh, and instead of allocating this money to libraries that then pay the fee for, for, for accessing the, the, the journals, uh, Scope 3 uh, pays for an article that is published by, by any researcher in the world. So uh, they basically set up prices, so we know that I don't know, I, I don't know the, the exact prices, but maybe to publish, they decided together with the publishers that nuclear physics B is, is worth $1,500. So if a researcher from, those, from one of those countries publish, uh, submits an article to nuclear physics B, then the, the, the scope three, once, it, once the article is accepted, pays the, 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 the journal with, with the collective money that, that it has gathered. Uh, is this clear? Okay. <coughs> okay, so uh, the case study I'm going to present to to today is the Journal of High Energy Physics. I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of it. Uh, it's a quite an important journal in, in the field. It, it's, it's now one of the three uh, top journals, I want to say, so in terms of impact factor and, and visibility within the, among the, within the community. Uh, it was, the idea was born in around 1993, if I'm not wrong, and in 1994 the first issue was published. Uh, again, it's, it's in the early days of, of electronic publishing, so it wasn't even called open access uh, yet, so because the, 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 the definition came, came a, few year, a few years later. Uh, and the idea was, was, was born at CISA, which is the institution I, 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 uh, where I studied, and was funded by, by public institutions in Italy, and basically it was uh, uh, managed by a small group of, of physicists from CISA. Uh, it's still one of the top journals. Um, I think that the processes that I'm going to describe for, for, for the birth of this journal are pretty much similar to other experiences that have come uh, later, but even before. But this one is one of the first ones that established itself as, as one of the core journals of its discipline, and 20 years later it is, is, still, is still healthy and, and powerful, if you want. Uh, Okay, so in describing the, this process, I'm going to use some metaphors taken from computer science because uh, I'm a bit uh, uh, nerdy and because the, 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 the scientists that I interviewed for, 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 this, uh, for this research are, of course, physicists and so they also are computer scientists. And so they used these, these terms during the interviews to refer not to technical uh, processes but rather to, 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 to societal or organizational processes. Um, 
So I thought I would adopt those terms as well because they're, very, they're, they're quite fine. They describe very, describe very well what happened. So the first one is forking. I don't know if you know what forking is. In a, with a, in, a, in a free software community, if you're not happy with the direction that the, the, the software that you're designing is, 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 has taken, you can fork the project. So you just take the, the, the software and, the, uh, uh, and take it to, 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 to a different direction. So you start your own uh, fork. It's like... It's like, a, it's like a tree of life. So you differentiate, uh, you e evolve and dif differentiating uh, the, the, the software or whatever it is. Um, so in this case, this is something that was happening at the time. This, the context is, is a situation in which uh, several journals and, uh, um, happened to, to go through the so-called declarations of independence. So uh, whole editorial boards were publicly declaring that they were uh, uh, quitting the journal and, and forking it. So they were creating a new journal, for example, it started, I think, according to my information, in 1989. So the Vegetatio, or the editorial board, resigned. They quit the journal. They started a new journal called uh, uh, Vegetation Science. So basically, the same journal was the journal was forked. Uh, so this is what happened basically with JHAP. So there, there wasn't a, there wasn't a orig an original journal, but they, they kind of forked from the, the, the journals that were at the time established. So Physical Letters B and, and Physics Review uh, B, if I'm not wrong, were, were, the, were the most important at the time. Um, the reasons for this forking were, uh, um, which, which, was, which, was, which was done in public, so it was discussed in, in, even in those journals and in scientific journals uh, publicly within the community, uh, were a reaction to the, to the monopoly of, of commercial publishers. So in particular, Sevier, which, which was perceived uh, as an evil player already 20 years ago. Um, uh, of course, physicists were providing free labor because because of the peer review they do for free and the editorial work they do what they were doing for they were doing for free. So the first thing that they, they had to do with this forking was to convince the to, to do a sort of a community building process. So they convinced mm -hmm. the community that they that they needed a new journal, which was, as they said, a journal by scientists uh, uh, for scientists. So they presented it as a creation, as a like sort of a grassroots creation from the community. So they managed to involve. Uh, lots of uh, important physicists, which, which means asking them to, to do editorial work, but also to submit their papers, which is the only way to uh, kickstart a, a new journal. Uh, um, it's interesting because openness and, and the, the reaction to, to, to the commercial publishers was used as a way to eticize, in a way, this new project and to coagulate scholars around it. So it was like uh, uh, important in that sense. Uh, one of their goals, though, it was to acquire or improve their control over communication uh, dynamics. Uh, so they, they really wanted to acquire a central position in the community. And the, uh, starting a new journal was key in that, in that sense. The second process was migration. I don't know if you want to know what migration is, but it's what you, when you migrate a system to a new software. Uh, it's a very dangerous, uh, by the way, process. If you're a computer scientist, you know which, which it's, it's a pain in the neck. Uh, uh, in their own words, we migrated a pre-existing system on, onto a new technology. Uh, so even though they had lots of opportunities in terms of innovating the journal model, uh, it's, it's 1994, the, the web is there, you, you, you have created it. You, you, you are, you're, not, you're not only a, scient a scientist, but you're a coder. Uh, you have the archive already, which is a, which is a great uh, uh, place which stores all knowledge pr produced in your field. Um, and this is not just something I, I, I'm proposing, like in, in uh, um, how, to, how, do you say the, how do you say this? Uh, I'm not just inventing possibilities, like in retrospective. The, the, those, those things were proposed. So for example, somebody proposed to, to, to uh, build the journal as, as an overlay to the archives. So instead of opening a new journal, you would, JHAP will be uh, sort of, a, uh, sort of, we will sort of crawl and browse uh, articles that were on the archive already, and then it would stamp it or rate the article as JHAP approved or something like that. This, this was a sort of a radical idea for the, for the time, and uh, it was met with resistance and refused. And they, they came, they even came to the point of uh, uh, creating tensions in the collective, which was managing, managing the journal, because the, the core uh, and the most, the most powerful uh, uh, people were uh, really wanted to do an old style journal, really wanted to do an electronic journal, but with the same peer review, editorial board, publication process, and so on and so forth. So the transformative potential of the web was, was, was downplayed, even though they had uh, some tools to, to imagine and perform some, some innovation in that field. So this is what media scholars 
called remediation. Uh, an old media is, is transformed or, or is migrated in, in onto a new media. Uh, a newspaper is not printed on paper only, but is also on the web, but it's still, it's still the same newspaper. Um, so the question is, is that is if those transformations were just premature for, premature for the time, or if the, the scientific journal is what somebody called a, a zombie media, so a media that we keep on, we keep, we keep on announcing its death, as television, for example, or, or, or many other media, media uh, but it keeps on being alive even though it's dead. Uh, it's the same for the archive, in a sense, because uh, the archive is nothing but the evolution of a practice that, that, that had been going on for decades for particle physicists, so they would have boards on a wall, uh, they will, they will mail, mail to each other their preprints, my like pieces of paper, and they will uh, simply nail the paper to the, to the board and people will, will consult them and they will, they will write back with responses and so on. The third process is rebooting, another very dangerous process. Uh, so uh, if you restart your, your operative system. Um, the the JHAP was actually restarted several times. Uh, it, it passed from, from openness to, to, to closeness and then to openness again. Uh, at a certain point it was uh, it ended up by being uh, operated by Springer. So it's still owned by CISA, but it's actually operated by Springer. And it was closed until gen January 1st this year when it, when it joined Scope 3, so it became open again and under, the, under that funding scheme. So after only a few years, I think it was, it was open access for three or four years, they just decided that their goals were met and openness was not their goal. Openness was not the goal per se. Uh, also because of peculiarities of the discipline. We don't read journals, was their, was their mantra when, 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 I, when I interviewed them. Uh, they have the archive. The, the journal is something they need to, to, to verify uh, and certify knowledge that is produced by, by particle physicists, but they don't, they don't go and download papers from journals. Uh, so there wasn't a political commitment to openness, and this is uh, uh, interesting for, for me, but openness was very important for them to, in order to acquire trust, uh, and, and to gather collaboration, to mobilize the community. It was sort of, a, sort of their flag uh, to, to show that you could do that in the open. It, it, would, it was free. It wasn't, okay? it wasn't even uh, green open access, so authors would, would, didn't have to pay for to publish uh, their papers. Um, but it was dropped, openness, after GHAP established itself as one of the core journals. At that point, openness was not an important tool anymore. They were able to, uh, to uh, pass to, 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 a new, to a new step. Uh, and, and simply change the, 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 moda the, the modality of, of distribution of, of their papers. Um, so I think it's very interesting that why we might perceive this as a, as a history of a failure, I think it's more something that, sh that shows the stability of science's communication system. So uh, to, see, to see it as a failure would be a very uh, activist viewpoint that we will adapt in order to describe this just as a failure. Uh, I think it's, it's more useful to see it as an example of, again, the, the, the stability and even resistance sometimes of, of the established uh, models of scholarly communication. So I, I wouldn't blame my physicist at CISA for, for choosing that the, the, the JAP didn't have to be open. Uh, it's very difficult to shake a system of knowledge production and circulation that, as Paul has shown, was stabilized over three centuries, and it's very important uh, for example, the, the fact that the papers are individual, they have a clear, clear identifiable author or, or authors, they are peer-reviewed, they are certified by prestigious editorial board, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult to shake such, such a, such a uh, stable and, and, and strict form of validating knowledge. <clears throat> it's the same if you want to, if you want to take further this, this genealogical uh, path that I've been taking, uh, it's, it's the same for Scope 3. So Scope 3 doesn't question or challenge the cycle of credit, the system of incentives, the organizational principles of, of, the, of the, 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 the scientific field, the system of evaluation or review. It's just a new way of allocating resources. It's, diff, it's an increased control of scientific bureaucracies over, over the publication process. Uh, uh, it kind of freezes the market because now journals have, 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 a, uh, have a price that it's, it's been uh, kind of frozen, so they, they have to, rig to they, if they want to increase the, increase the price for, for papers that they publish, they have to go and renegotiate re 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 that with the whole uh, consortium. <clears throat> okay, so the question, the, moving out of high energy physics and particle physics is that w why only 20 years after somebody started journals with those possibilities, we, we, we start have seeing mega journals 
uh, uh, open peer review, alternative metrics, and other things we're going to discuss uh, as, as the, the open questions of this seminar. So this, this is a question I leave open to discussion, of course, because I don't have the answer. Uh, it's very interesting to see, according to me, if, this, if more radical transformations such as uh, uh, do-it-yourself approach it to science, crowdsourcing in science, new forms of collaboration that happen in the open, uh, wiki science, and so on and so forth, will be able to actually become uh, a, an hege hegemonic pr paradigm of knowledge production. Uh, and this is also because I want to propose the idea that open science is, is a threat. Uh, it, it does contribute to uh, restructure some societal and power relationship within, within, the, within, within, the, within the scientific field. Um, and it, represent again, it represents, again, an, a threat to the social contract of science. So at least two things I want to mention. A threat to the cognitive authority of science, so the, of science. Um, so the ability to claim that knowledge produced in scientific institutions is, institutions is better than other types of knowledge. So what's going to happen when Science 2.0 or Open Science is going to show that scientific knowledge can be always beta because it's always incrementable, uh, or it's negoti negotiated among different types of, uh, uh, for example, social groups. And then it's also a threat to the role of science in, uh, in liberal societies. Uh, the way knowledge is produced is, of course, a key part of the economic, uh, political, and even military, or military order of our societies. Uh, so the risk, according to me, is that this transformation, this transformation might, might be uh, only partial and or it might take decades to actually uh, become, uh, to, to stabilize. Uh, so other than technological change and, and activism in, in this field and even uh, uh, scientists' different approaches to openness, uh, I think that deep, a, more, a deeper so, 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 so social political change is needed. And this is arguably already happening uh, and might in, in, in the digital world and digital corporations, uh, where everything is happening in other fields of information and, 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 and knowledge production. And it, it, it could, of course, favor a systemic change also in science. Uh, including then, at this point, also funding, the, rewarding system, the reward system, the system of autoreality, uh, the new forms of public negotiation of science, if it's done in the open, in the sense not only of sharing information, but also of, of opening up the boundaries of who can decide about which science we should produce and how. Uh, okay, so to, to conclude, I can't, I can't really answer to the question, what's the, what, what's, what's the future of open science? And I hope this seminar will actually propose some, some of those futures and we will be able to discuss them, um, the, the incentives and, and goals of future open science. Um, um, I just want to conclude by saying that this, if, if a systemic change is to happen, uh, this has to, in, to include, uh, to, to involve, as, as, as we, 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 we heard, we've heard before, major shifts in, in the economic structure of science. And so we should, we should be wondering who can fund uh, a systemic change for open science. And I think that the two actors that we have uh, uh, now uh, in sight are, of course, uh, public, public funding, so the state, uh, so st state, pat state patronage, uh, or the digital capital, so digital corporations. And in both cases, we run the risk of building not a more distributed and democratic science, but rather a more concentrated uh, way of producing science. So if we, if we, if we think about uh, digital capitalism, we're talking about institutions that, that accumulate an incredible concentration of wealth and power. Um, I'm finished. <laughs> um, okay, so I want, just wanted to encourage uh, the, the crowd here to, to think uh, further um, than, the dis I mean, to think n not only about the distinction between all the opposition between open and closed, and closed science, but also about economic and power relationships in the, in the scientific field. And uh, thanks, obrigado. And, uh, well, good afternoon. I hope you're still awake. Uh, and I'll try not to put you to sleep. Um, it, I know it's a long afternoon, and if you're confused about what open science is, I don't blame you. I, I'm really confused myself, too. Uh, so let's try to unpack some of these questions about open science to see if we can come to some common understanding of what, uh, whether we have some common language, ideas, principles with which we could begin to explore uh, common issues uh, and tackle common problems. Uh, but before I do that, I want to also thank the organizers, Sarita, uh, Luca, Alex, uh, Annie, and, and all those other involved in putting together this very interesting seminar. 
uh, many interesting people from different disciplines with very, very different backgrounds and interests uh, and highly, highly interdisciplinary. So I uh, applaud you for putting this, uh, this workshop together uh, and for um, uh, and for inviting us. Thank you very much. And also want to say that this is not my first time in Brazil. In fact, I've been coming to this country for close to 20 years now, but I'm ashamed to admit that uh, I have only know how to say a few words of, uh, of Portuguese, one of which is Caperinha. So, <laughs> and I think our, 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 our translators deserves extra one or two of those after this afternoon because I know they have a very tough job. So, uh, uh, applause to you all. So. And when I told my, my, my wife that I was coming to Rio earlier this year when I was invited, she said, Dan, you're going to go see the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I wish, you know, I, I love the Brazilian team. And I, 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 my condolences to all of you. And I, I, I hope Neymar is doing a lot better right now. I, I hope he's recovering. So next time. So he's still young. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, as I said, I've been, I've been coming to this country because I've been working with colleagues in Campinas uh, if on a project called uh, BioLine International. Uh, it is from that project and from working with my colleagues in Brazil and from other parts of the so-called developing countries that I've been forced to think about a lot of issues about the power dynamics of, uh, of knowledge production. That is, because I'm an academic, because I teach in, in a fairly privileged university uh, in, uh, in North America, the University of Toronto, I have access to a lot of resources. And when I work with colleagues, I was often surprised at how little uh, they have in terms of equipment, uh, uh, finances, uh, uh, classrooms, and, and, and uh, uh, access to scientific literature. Uh, and so my university spent millions and millions of dollars on subscription uh, to scientific articles. And uh, when I went to India the first time, they have a handful of journals on the shelves, and that's about it. Uh, and that is not, hasn't changed that dramatically over the last 20 years, despite uh, the internet and so forth. But uh, things have changed also very positively in many respects with regard to open access. And I want to build on my own experience with open access and, and ask some questions about uh, what it is that uh, we're, we're advocating and, and what does that have to do with development. Uh, if I haven't made it clear, I also teach in a development studies program. Uh, in, in addition to understanding the power dynamics of academic production, uh, I'm interested in using that academic knowledge, uh, production of academic knowledge as a case studies that reflect on the larger pictures of global inequality. That is, the inequality of the power dynamics of academic institutions really is a mirror of the inequality of institution in other situations. So when you think about big pharmacies, uh, uh, big corporations, and other kind of uh, a mono monopolistic power that have uh, control over resources and over people's livelihood, uh, 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 academics institution is really very much a mirror of that despite the fact that we think we're highly liberal. So I want to unpack this question about what, 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 what we mean by using open science to, to interrogate development. Uh, and I also want to take this opportunity to introduce uh, a project we just recently launched a, a week or so ago, and this is a project called Open and Collaborative, Collaborative Science and Development Network. Um, and it's a project that's funded by the International Development Research Center in Canada uh, with the intention of funding a number of projects that are going to be based in developing countries to explore the question of what is open science, what can we learn from open science, what are the contexts under which these things happen, and how do we begin to collect quality data that would allow us to answer some of these very complex questions, uh, and, and particularly in a, a different, uh, in multiple contexts and institutional environment. Uh, so we're very excited about the launch of this network, and uh, I will have time in the last 10 minutes to give you a little bit of overview, and hopefully some of you would like to find out more about and in maybe even apply for funding support uh, from the network uh, project. Now, I, unlike uh, Paul, who has given you a very deep 
historical view uh, of uh, European history and how science is embedded in that uh, patronage system. Uh, and and, and uh, Alessandro giving you a more recent case study. I'm going to give you some personal reflections. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I get some uh, a little bit uh, using my own case study in, in terms of the lessons that I've learned. Uh, uh, primarily uh, through open access. Um, and in the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been also very uh, interested in, in a particular way of looking at development issues. Um, as many of the, you know, development is often measured in economic terms, so that for that case, uh, the World Bank would advocate for measuring development in terms of GDP growth, so that countries are ranked in terms of the GDP performances, the more GDP production, uh, the more is considered to be uh, developing. So, so development has often been predicated on uh, economic advance. And so research in science and technologies have always taken the assumptions that if you invest in, in science de and development, it will create knowledge uh, uh, and it will locally and it will uh, result in better investment in local uh, industries and, and research and institution and university and so forth. And that will in turn generate uh, economic outcomes uh, through better industries and so on and so forth. So that assumption has been a long standing one. So investment in science is about uh, return on investment uh, to a large extent and that would feed into the overall GDP growth. Uh, in recent years, we, we know, you know, particularly given the 2008, 2009, uh, financial crisis uh, began that began in the United States and spread around the world that that particular model of unlimited consumption and accumulations uh, 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 has is not sustainable it has benefited very few and what we have seen increasingly is the growing inequality between the rich and the poor and the rich has gotten super 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 rich and the poor has remained very poor and that gap has widened even more now than it has ever been, uh, despite decades of development. So uh, the kind of models that has, that has been uh, in, in, in practice uh, is clearly broken. And increasingly, we, we think that the way to rethink development is to think about how we empower citizens, that how do we change the dynamics of the people uh, like you and I to be able to claim rights, to be able to assert our rights to knowledge and our rights to uh, know as a means to be uh, 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 better participate in the political process. And that is really the way to gain a control back in terms of some of the social system and justice and so forth. Uh, I, <laughs> I have to tell this story about yesterday. I have an encounter with your uh, social system yesterday. I was walking along the street and I was drinking a bottle of, uh, you know, bottled water and accidentally the cap of my bottle fell off and I must have kicked it while I was walking and the, the bottle cap uh, must have traveled in front of me. And very quickly there were two people that came out of the corner. One is the, this municipal guard with very heavy police <laughs> uh, uniform and the other guy, you know, with this all these badges and so forth. Uh, they asked me for my passport number and so forth. And of course, I had no idea what they want, wanted my passport and so forth. They gave me this weird piece of paper to look at. And it's only in Portuguese. I have no idea what it was about. And I was not about to give them my passport number. So they followed me back to the hotel, insisted I give them the passport. I ended up calling the Canadian embassy, thinking that the Canadian embassy would do something for me. So I got the consulate general uh, of Canada to talk to these guys. In the end, they in their insistence that because I was intending to litter, uh, that they were not going to let me go without taking my um, passport number and giving me a ticket. Uh, and the Council General of Canada in the end said, just give them the number, you should be okay. So, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I just thought, okay, here's a system where uh, fairly, you know, privileged person like myself traveling is confronted with a system where I feel completely powerless, even with, with the help of the embassy. Uh, and I have no way to challenge that system I mean, without having to have a great deal of cost 
in terms of time, in terms of potential uh, other consequences. It's just better to say, give in, give them my passport, maybe have to pay a ticket fine so that I can leave the country or something. Uh, so that kind of power structure is something that we confront all the time, but so sometimes more blatantly, sometimes less so. But an ordinary citizen without recourse to resources, to education, to the rights to knowledge, have absolutely no way of dealing with system of power like that. How do they go find out what it is that they're, they're confronting? And I think to me, uh, uh, one of the key issues about development is individuals, the citizens' rights to be a question and to question not only authority, but to question authority of, authority of knowledge. And that, in order to do so, they not only want to be able to access knowledge, but to be able to participate in the making of knowledge. That, to me, is what I would refer to as the rights-based approach uh, uh, to knowledge uh, and to development. And uh, as I thought through these kind of process over the years, uh, I also began to think about what this thing called research is, because research is really a, a funny thing, uh, and it's different for different disciplines, right? Biologists, molecular biologists, uh, social scientists, uh, have all different ways of doing research, and we all think our way of doing research is right or logical or makes sense, but when someone from another discipline look at the way we do research, they say, you guys are crazy, you make no sense at all, right? This would be better to do it this way or that way. So we all think we know what we're doing when we do research, or, or at least if we're honest, we say we're just muddling our way through. But, um, but we all struggle with this idea of research. And when we teach students how to do research, we are also passing on certain assumptions, certain uncertainties, and a whole, de whole great deal of assumption and ideological baggages, uh, some of which Paul has identified. So uh, I've become also very interested in looking critically uh, at the notion of research itself. What does it mean to do research uh, and what does it mean to do open research and open science uh, from a critical standpoint? And, and ultimately, could these kind of reflection and new practices and challenging ourselves to rethink research and science, could these then help us transform the power dynamics between those who have powers and those who do not have powers? Um, I, I meant to show this slide earlier. Most of you know who Ban Ki-moon is, the current UN Gen Secretary General. Uh, and he also admitted that, that the, the current model of development is broken, and what we need is a, a more equitable uh, system and vision, uh, uh, strive for a healthier planet, uh, with less pollution, and, and a kind of dynamic inclusiveness uh, that would in, uh, that is not only relying on certain modes of uh, capitalist production. Uh, and so uh, open science to me is to a large extent about that as well. So that to rethink a more equitable system of knowledge productions and communication. Uh, and the old model, uh, 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 I, would, I would disagree with my colleague Alessandro this way, and it's not that it's stable, it's just that it's the power structure that be that has been maintaining that status quo. It's not stable, it's actually very, very shaky. Uh, and this is the world as we know it. Uh, and this is the world as seen, seen through the lens of the uh, journal citation uh, uh, impact factor. Uh, this data is slightly old. This is about 10 years old data. Uh, but I think you all get the picture. So this is based on uh, how journals are being ranked, indexed by the uh, Thomson uh, Journal Citation Index. The more uh, uh, countries that have journals that are ranked and indexed by ISI, the bigger proportionally it shows up in that country. And by the same token, the less articles that are indexed by ISI coming from those countries, they are the, the smaller they appear. So in this case, you notice the United States is very fat, and so is Europe and Japan. Uh, you, you may not recognize them, but uh, the whole of Africa, is like a pencil, as a colleague of mine calls it, a pencil thin, it, and it's not for South Africa. Uh, the continent is invisible. Now, Brazil is kind of visible a little bit, that green thing there on the side there. Uh, and through other effort like Cialo, if we were to remap some of these open access journals that are now indexed by ISI, we might see a different picture uh, in terms of that dynamic. 
But my point here is simply that if you look at the world through a certain kind of lens, and in this case, the ISI Journal Impact Factor, as the lens to measure what is supposed to be a value in terms of knowledge production, you see a particular world that is distorted, tipped tip, tip completely uh, uh, in favor of the norm. And this is where the term global south becomes much more um, poignant because you can see the contrast between the, the north and the south in very, very uh, straight contrast. Uh, Again, this is, doesn't mean that there's no knowledge produced in other parts of the world. It's just those knowledge are not being valued through the same system. Uh, and so the questions that we would like to entertain through the Open Science Project is, what kind of lens should we create? What kind of lens that would allow us to see the world in a, in a different way, in a newly distorted way, but in ways that we can understand that would bring in the kind of neglected issues and so forth. Um, and how can network itself help us do that? Now, uh, let's not pretend that the network hasn't changed things, right? So, so in our own s lifetime, the, 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 the network itself have, uh, came only the web, as mentioned before, is only 20 years old, but have changed the way we, we live, changed the way we, 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 we interact with each other, change the way we, we make a, a living and change the way we do science and communicate science. Uh, and so uh, it is radically different. Um, I can't help also to point out that this project that we were involved with in the early days of the web, my colleagues and I thought, okay, with this thing called the World Wide Web, when we have a bunch of these journals in the developing countries that we cannot get to other parts of the world because of the high cost of print and so forth, why don't we digitize these things and put it on the web and see what happened? And from 1993, we grew to quite a number of journals over the years. Um, now, in 1993, I was only 12 years old then, but you get the picture. That's not true. Uh, so uh, we've learned a number of lessons in terms of uh, those early days of putting stuff on the web. And, and, and I, uh, this, um, contrary to I, what I was told, oh, those journals, no one's going to pay attention to them. They're from Africa, they're from India, uh, they're from Brazil, who cares? Because we want journals from Harvard, we want journals from Yale, we want journals from Cambridge and Oxford and so forth. Uh, but what we found over the years is that in fact there's huge demand for, uh, for knowledge coming out from other parts of the world, particularly knowledge that are relevant to other researchers and people from, uh, from uh, contexts that are similar to those research contexts. So if you have high, co high, high uh, medical journal, expensive medical journals that are given away to uh, people I I in, in, um, in, in Mozambique, uh, and the doctors there cannot make use of those information because their hospital structures are so poor that a lot of those techniques they talk about in terms of operations and so forth are simply irrelevant because the medications and the operating equipment is just not there. So, so those kind of knowledge transfer are meaningless because what we call the absorptive capacity, that is the ability to uh, take those knowledge and make them into useful uh, uh, actions uh, are not there. So we need to understand the absorptive capacity of the places that we're dealing with uh, in order to do that. Now, can the network help us better understand uh, network, uh, the, the absorptive capacity, and can the network actually help build the absorptive capacity uh, of, of different uh, contexts? Uh, this is where the whole web been something that we've been trying to, to, to grapple with in terms of the kind of new economic models that is being made possible. Uh, Yohai Benkler has called uh, this kind of new economy the network information economy. And this book, many of you might have heard of before. If not, I would strongly urge you to, to take a look at it. It's completely free online, and there are wiki versions that are highly annotated. Uh, in this book, uh, Bankler, this is one of the first books that really systematically look at the emerging network information in economy, and in which he argues that the kind of industrial model of, of knowledge production is no longer 
uh, uh, valid because of the way we deal with each other through networks, uh, through pure commons-based productions. Uh, open source is, is, is a primary example that he used, but he also used Wikipedia as an example, and he asked this very interesting question. He said, what does Wikipedia got to do with people who have no access to drinking water? Uh, now, by that, he doesn't mean that somehow Wikipedia will magically bring water to the people who don't have access to water. By, by that, he really was asking whether peers' production could mean something to the people who do not have access to clean water. That is, the way you operate to produce knowledge, could it be used in the same way to produce access to other <laughs> kind of public goods, such as wa water, such as uh, education, such as health? That is, could a, could a non-market-based could a non -market -based model help us uh, lead to better provision and distribution of goods through a peers production model that is analogous to that of Wikipedia? And if so, what would that look like? And again, this is a million dollar question. Uh, I meant to show you this earlier, sorry. Um, this, this is the byline thing I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are the kind of journals, partners we've been working with from, from different parts of the world. And I just grabbed a screenshot from an Google Analytics yesterday and look at who was reading the journal articles from our system, and you can see that uh, all m people from all over the world, particularly in countries and in, in cities that are considered developing countries, are, are accessing our databases regularly. And I got these cities break down. In fact, most of the top cities, I can't, I did the first ones is not resolved, are from the developing world. So, uh, so this tells us that there's great demand for reading these articles, great demand by the people who wants to put these research out. But what we don't know is what are people doing with these articles? They're downloading them, right? They're reading them, hopefully. Uh, but then what are they doing with these materials beyond reading them? We'd like to know, and those are the kind of research questions uh, we like to address. And also, uh, are we seeing a new kind of dynamics? Whereas in the past, we saw the knowledge transfer from the north to the south. Uh, are we seeing the kind of knowledge transfer because of network of a more horizontal kind of knowledge transfer through real network without the centralized uh, hierarchical model so that every center could become literally, or every node could become a center, so to speak, depending on the kind of expertise they have to provide. And this is one of the questions we're gonna find, find out now. There are lots of interesting study in recent years that are helping us think through these things. So this book here just came out, the one on the wealth of the commons, a, a collection of scholars, 70 some odd scholars that work in different areas of resource common, thinking about non-market production and how they may work in different settings. The book on the one on the internet success, it's just a, pub, it's just a book just recently published. Uh, and it's uh, a two scholar looking at open source uh, 7,000 projects that are archived on SourceForge, and he look at how, how many of these projects succeeded and how many of them failed, and look at the commonalities, factors, critical uh, governance issues, and so forth that make those projects successful and what makes projects fail. And so they already have a very interesting set of theoretical framework uh, that is based on the frameworks called uh, uh, institutional analysis and development framework that's developed by a famous economist by the name of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who passed away a few years ago and before she got, well, I think she got the Nobel Prize in economics before she, she passed away. But before she, she passed away, she was also starting to think of uh, knowledge as a form of commons. So how can you, we think about knowledge the same way we think about other kinds of resource commons and the kind of governance framework for those kind of resource commons, could they be applicable to uh, the kind of knowledge commons we're talking about in terms of scientific productions and network-based collaboration? I'm also happy to see that there are science policy makers that are also chiming in in the discussion that there are science policy maker that sees that because infrastructures are, the traditional infrastructures, the lab and the so forth, uh, are poor in many institutions, uh, it is important that these uh, uh, infrastructure be created in a, in a different way. And network seems to be the solution to some of these. And this book uh, have some number of case studies that uh, document how network is providing the kind of uh, 
interconnected infrastructures that were not possible before. By the way, all these slides are on SlideShare. There's a, there's a link I put at the beginning of it. So if you, if you go to my Twitter account, you'll find the SlideShare. There's all the slides are already online. Um, and, and in addition to the scholar who look at commons-based resource, the development agencies, including the IDRC, are very actively engaged in looking at uh, um, this whole notion of openness and how it affects development. And so this is a recent book, again, freely online, that uh, look at uh, openness as a model or a hypothesis uh, to see how uh, the ubiquity of the network and the different kinds of intellectual property regimes that are the non-patent and open uh, 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 licensings are providing alternatives for different kind of livelihood, the different kinds of uh, well-being uh, improvements and so forth. So this book has uh, quite a number of examples. Now that comes to the last thing I want to say, which is the, the same agency, the IDRC, is funding this uh, open and collaborative science development network. Uh, and uh, we're very excited about this. A number of the people involved in the network, uh, some of you whom you'll be, you'll be, you will be speaking as well, Cameron Nalen, Matthew Todd, and Denise Akiras, and uh, uh, Alex, all, all been involved with the, with the planning of this uh, network. And we're looking for projects from around the world uh, that would do uh, demonstrate uh, or provide data or critical theories or concepts that look at uh, the notion of open science uh, and how it relates to development. Uh, so you can go to the website uh, to find out more about the aims. We're really trying to find out wh whether open science, if and whether uh, and under what conditions uh, it provides uh, the r development uh, uh, solutions and, and how do we uh, frame those issues in such a way that they are also scalable uh, and, and that they have downstream impact in terms of policy engagement. Uh, we want to uh, really, well, look at some of these issues uh, both from an empirical standpoint and from also from a theoretical standpoint uh, so that uh, we want to look at the whole process of, of, of uh, scientific uh, research life cycle. And then when I say scientific, I don't mean just the laboratory science. I mean all areas of inquiry. So including, I, I, I'm a social scientist, so uh, I, I just use science very broadly as systematic form of inquiry, uh, evidence-based um, um, uh, approach to, to knowledge. So science is just very broadly uh, uh, framed that way. So. Don't think that because you're not a natural scientist or biological scientist that you're not part of this network. So I'd like you to think more broadly. So um, I think I've run out of time. So I won't give you all the details, but I want to just give you, make sure that I give you the address. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I said that one of the things we're trying to do is to have a theoretical framework that would allow us to bring together these very diverse kind of uh, phenomena. You know, some people could be doing open seeds, you know, sharing open, uh, sharing open source seed. Some people could be doing open source drug discovery. Some people could be doing open educational resources. Some could be doing uh, very, very different kinds of phenomena, the hacking, open hacking or biohacking. Uh, all these kind of things, what do they have in common? Well, what can they tell us about um, uh, some downstream impact? And we're beginning to create a more coherent set of uh, mechanisms to identify who are the actors, what are the institutional settings, what are the me common mechanisms, and what are the policy issues that enable different uh, kind of uh, dynamics and processes to flourish on the one hand or to stifle them on the other. So we can begin to categorize or catalog these kind of activities. Uh, and we're gonna try to at least built on uh, some of those existing framework. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom's, uh, the institutional uh, uh, analysis and development framework is one example. I'd be very interested in going back to Paul David's framework, for example, of open science and, and remap some of the current things to see whether they uh, help us work through some of the institutional issues. Uh, and these are all questions that are, that are, that are open. Uh, and as I said, but the network is only beginning. We just literally launch it. And these are just frameworks that we're working with. These are all working hypotheses, and it will change over time, and I welcome you to come to the website. 
uh, and read the material. If you want to join the network in one way or the other, we really welcome your input. Uh, bring us your project or bring us attention to projects you think are relevant to us. Critique us, tell us where we go wrong, uh, how we can do better, and how we can collaborate better. Thank you. I will read to try to be objective. Bom, eu acho que entender o significado do atual movimento pela ciência aberta implica reconhecer sua inserção no contexto mais amplo da existência de uma forte tensão entre a socialização do conhecimento, da informação e da cultura de um lado e sua privatização de outro. Por um lado, temos, desde fins do século XX, o alargamento dos mecanismos de, de apropriação privada da produção intelectual e cultural, tanto pelo endurecimento dos instrumentos de proteção da propriedade intelectual, como por meio de novas formas e estratégias de captura, apropriação e valorização dessa produção coletiva. Por outro lado, desenvolvem-se novas práticas e espaços de interação, de produção colaborativa, expressando importantes inovações sociais nas dinâmicas produtivas, políticas e culturais, as quais se valem das novas plataformas digitais. Partindo desse cenário, eu queria propor uma abordagem que se desenvolve em torno de dois grandes conjuntos de argumento. Primeiro, o de que essa tensão constitui um dos principais pontos de antagonismos e lutas que movem as atuais mudanças no que alguns chamam de capitalismo cognitivo, capitalismo digital, sociedade informacional, economia da informação, do conhecimento e do aprendizado. Segundo, o de que devemos olhar essa questão, principalmente como um dos cernes da questão e da construção da democracia nas sociedades contemporâneas. Então, é dessa perspectiva que eu proponho aqui pensar o debate e o embate em torno do movimento pela ciência aberta. Considero que essa temática se investe de um caráter que é diretamente político, sendo central nas relações de poder nas sociedades contemporâneas, como já foi extensamente dito aqui. Implica superar a perspectiva de pensar a ciência e a mudança técnica a partir simplesmente da sua produtividade intrínseca ou centralmente por sua eficácia econômica, colocando foco nas relações entre ciência e poder, ou mais amplamente, entre saber e poder. Trata-se, em primeiro lugar, de um debate e de um embate no plano das significações. Ciência aberta é um termo guarda-chuva que engloba diferentes tipos de práticas e abordagens e que também permite múltiplas e, por vezes, conflituosas interpretações. Ela mobiliza frequentemente interesses e pontos de vista em antagonismo. De um lado, o regime de proteção de direitos de propriedade intelectual, ancora-se em uma narrativa teórica e em um regime discursivo, fundados, em boa medida, no, no ideário que procura legitimar os direitos de propriedade do cor. A extensão de direitos de propriedade para o âmbito da produção intelectual amplia e aprofunda relações capitalistas de mercado para áreas que até então constituíam uma reserva social. No centro do discurso da propriedade intelectual está o paradigma do autor individual como criador de novo conhecimento. A essa concepção contrapõe-se, primeiramente, a ideia de que todo novo conhecimento advém de conhecimento prévio e, sendo um produto social, seu valor não é inteiramente atribuível a nenhum autor em particular. As atuais justificativas para direitos de propriedade intelectual dirigem-se menos para os direitos de autores e inventores como criadores de conhecimento e mais para os incentivos econômicos para a reprodução de objetos de conhecimento, beneficiando não indivíduos criadores, mas empresas. De outro, advoga-se que a ciência aberta promove o aumento dos estoques de conhecimento público, propiciando não apenas a ampliação dos índices gerais, índices gerais de produtividade científica e de inovação, como também das taxas de retornos sociais dos investimentos em ciência e tecnologia. Além disso, tem se demonstrado historicamente que é no compartilhamento e na abertura, de modo coletivo e não individual, que ocorre a criatividade e a inovatividade, hoje valendo-se das infraestruturas de conexão e interação em redes. 
É nesse mesmo quadro que se projetam abordagens e práticas análogas, como as de cocriação, e-science, produção peer-to-peer, -peer, produção wiki, crowdsourcing, co-inovação, inovação aberta, entre outros. A necessidade de resolução de problemas de alta complexidade e os elevados custos da pesquisa tem movido boa parte dos pesquisadores a buscar colaboração direta, frequentemente por meios interpessoais e informais, a despeito dos limites macro e meso-institucionais. A formalização de redes de colaboração interinstitucionais enfrenta barreiras que frequentemente levam ao engessamento da pesquisa e do intercâmbio de conhecimentos e informações na contracorrente da, hoje, da, da agilidade hoje propiciada pelas novas plataformas de informação e comunicação. Em paralelo, a difusão das atuais redes infocomunicacionais e da cultura livre digital contamina as formas de produzir e circular conhecimento e informação em ciência. Alguns entendem que estaríamos testemunhando a expansão de um novo tipo de intersubjetividade em torno de uma atividade coletiva de trabalho a que se, deve, a se adere voluntariamente. Motivações não meramente instru instrumentais ou por ganhos materiais, mas pela gratificação e o bem-estar psicológico, pela conectividade social. Assim, multiplicam-se e difundem é, relações e formas de produção não proprietárias com maior autonomia dos participantes e em formatos não necessariamente estruturados e hierarquizados, traços que sempre foram mais marcantes na produção e circulação da informação e do conhecimento do que na produção material. A cultura hacker é emblemática desse paradigma de produção colaborativa. É uma forma de vida que comanda esse movimento de resistência. Por outro lado, se esse movimento incrementa a produção coletiva, abre também novas frentes e brechas à captura privada dessa informação e conhecimento coletivamente produzidos. Trata-se, portanto, de um embate entre distintas formas de apropriação social e privada. Novos modelos de negócio desenvolvem-se em torno da ideia do conhecimento aberto, seja ciência, tecnologia, inovação ou mesmo a produção cultural. A propriedade intelectual, porém, ao mesmo tempo em que captura, também bloqueia essa potência produtiva da ciência e, de modo mais amplo, do conhecimento e da cultura, extraindo valor, sobretudo, da interrupção dos movimentos de, co de cooperação. Esse capitalismo né, ele sobrevive da exploração parasitária e rentista da produção coletiva, oferecendo condições para sua reprodução, como nas plataformas gratuitas de acesso às redes digitais, ao mesmo tempo que estraga essa própria dinâmica da valorização. De um lado, a propriedade intelectual necessita impor-se por meio do comando e do controle, exigindo um aparato repressivo que procura compensar ou mitigar a fragilidade de uma legislação que se revela anacrônica e inaplicável nas atuais dinâmicas produtivas. De outro, a mercantilização do conhecimento e da informação requer a continuidade da polinização, que, por sua vez, pressupõe liberdade em processos de contínua ressocialização do conhecimento. Nesse sentido, os instrumentos de propriedade intelectual em seu atual formato já não cabem mais no novo paradigma. São mecanismos de escassez artificial de algo que não se esgota, mas que, ao contrário, se fertiliza e se reproduz na livre troca e nas interações, em um regime de acumulação baseado na produção de conhecimento por meio de conhecimento para gerar, gerar valor. Assim, na contracorrente dos novos cercamentos do que é produzido em comum, coloca-se a crise de execução das relações de propriedade. Na era das redes e do acesso, os próprios marcos jurídicos tradicionais de propriedade são postos em xeque. Outro aspecto diz respeito a se a ciência aberta orienta-se basicamente para uma relação estrita e restrita ao chamado campo científico, ou se, alternativamente, refere-se à abertura da ciência, à interseção e mesmo à intervenção de diferentes e outros tipos de saberes, a sua relação com a alteridade, com o outro. 
Entende-se dessa ótica que a geração de informação e conhecimento relevantes à ciência, tecnologia e inovação constitui cada vez mais processo que se espalha pela sociedade inteira, uma produção coletiva na qual participam múltiplos atores e agentes, suas dinâmicas de experimentação e aprendizado coletivo. Cruciais são as sinergias entre informações e conhecimentos formalizados e ditos avançados e de outros saberes não formalizados, construídos nas práticas sociais, muitos até então considerados saberes sujeitados. Aqui, o novo papel do conhecimento não remete simplesmente à nova centralidade da ciência ou de uma classe criativa. Trata-se, sobretudo, da socialização do conhecimento por meio da produção coletiva de uma intelectualidade difusa. Algo que se desenvolve e produz não mais em estoques, mas, fundamentalmente, fluxos. Desta perspectiva, a ciência aberta é algo que requer e promove fluidificar a circulação de informações, lubrificando o processo de produção de conhecimento, o saber coletivo sendo feito de conexões na diversidade. Por fim, cabe ainda indagar se no, da, no debate e nos embates em torno da ciência aberta estão também em questão distintas perspectivas geopolíticas, geoeconômicas e geoculturais, e ainda distintas posições e interesses de diferentes segmentos sociais. Coloca-se aqui a indagação que ciência aberta, para que tipo de desenvolvimento, para quem? Os pobres são certamente os mais afetados pelos sistemas de apropriação privada de conhecimento e pelas patentes em particular, principalmente em áreas sensíveis, como a de medicamentos, agricultura e alimentação, na medida em que esses sistemas elevam artificialmente os preços de produto, o que certamente afeta mais os pobres. Não difundem amplamente os benefícios dos avanços do conhecimento, sobretudo para os pobres. Enviesam os focos da pesquisa para a área de interesses dos ricos e não dos pobres. Colocam barreiras à pesquisa e logo à inovação, particularmente em áreas de interesse dos pobres. A ciência aberta coloca neste aspecto em pauta uma nova agenda de direitos, sejam eles humanos e sociais, sejam também direitos que visam garantir a sustentabilidade e a sobrevivência da vida de modo amplo. A questão da propriedade intelectual deixa, então, de pertencer a uma arena meramente técnica, de interesse limitado a especialistas, para mobilizar um amplo espectro de atores sociais que veem suas vidas diretamente afetadas por esse aparato legal. Esses direitos tocam em áreas que vão da produção cultural à produção científico-tecnológica, passando pela saúde, o meio ambiente, a alimentação e a agricultura, entre outros. Amplia-se a consciência de que a legislação que regula esses direitos tem efeitos que vão muito além dos econômicos. Ela media diretamente a experiência humana, o bem-estar e a liberdade, regulando do modo como podemos aprender, pensar e criar juntos, até como e se temos acesso a medicamentos e alimentos que precisamos para viver. O modo de produção em rede abre, então, oportunidades para novos ciclos de lutas, onde a partir, a partir de uma mesma infraestrutura. Trata-se, então, de alternativas complementares ou em disputa? Coloca-se em questão em que consistem formas novas e inovadoras de constituição e instituições do comum ou da ciência nos, no, como um dos bens comuns. Inovações institucionais e sociais que permitam proteger o que é coletiva e socialmente produzido da sua apropriação é, privada serão cruciais para lidar com as questões que se colocam nesse momento de crise e transformação. Assim, no desenvolvimento da ciência, atuam não apenas fatores de ordem técnica, como a disponibilidade de plataformas computacionais e infraestrutura tecnológica para compartilhamento de dados, mas também fatores institucionais, normativos, políticos e culturais, 
Os esforços de ciência aberta envolvem instâncias de ação e decisão diferenciadas, que vão desde o pesquisador individual até o nível macro das políticas públicas e das regulações internacionais, passando pelo nível meso das instituições de pesquisa e agências de fomento. Mais importantes são os novos usos que implicam em transformações nos métodos e estruturas lógicas da pesquisa e, logo, em seus resultados, em um processo de aprendizado e inovação contínuos. Boa parte dessas questões diz respeito aos mecanismos de governança, mais especificamente de governança informacional, entre os vários é, participantes, o que, mais uma vez, remete às formas de gestão e resolução de conflitos e de poder. Postas essas premissas, eu tenho me colocado, então, como ponto, questões de pesquisa, algumas indagações. Quais os significados que se tem atribuído e que se podem atribuir à ciência aberta? Trata-se de um novo modo ou paradigma de fazer ciência? O que tem motivado a propagação desse movimento? Ou seja, que interesses estão né, em jogo? Que novas práticas, experiências e formatos de pesquisa têm se desenvolvido nesse quadro? em que elas repercutem nas formas de produção, circulação e uso da informação e conhecimento em ciência. Quais têm sido seus principais avanços, obstáculos e resultados? Que fatores impulsam e dificultam seu desenvolvimento? Em que medida e com que mecanismos abrem-se novas possibilidades de interlocução entre diferentes tipos de saberes? Que novas institucionalidades e estruturas são necessárias nesse contexto? Em que medida essas práticas repercutem nas relações entre informação, conhecimento e poder? Quais suas repercussões para se pensar novos estilos de desenvolvimento que coloquem a questão da democracia social, política, cultural no seu âmago? Que novidades, oportunidades e desafios colocam seu Brasil nesse cenário? Que condições devem ser estabelecidas e que políticas e estratégias devem ser traçadas ante este quadro? Portanto, eu acho que o que eu deixo são mais perguntas do que propriamente soluções. Muito obrigada. Fala no microfone e se identifica, por favor. Boa tarde, eu sou Henrique Parra, é da Universidade Federal de São Paulo. E também parabenizar os colegas pelas instigantes apresentações. É, eu queria aproveitar ah, as, as perspectivas que foram apresentadas. Eu acho que trouxe um, um debate realmente é, coloca um, um problema é, no perspectiva internacional. E, e eu acho que é a partir daí que eu fiquei com algumas, ah, na verdade, é, pensando junto, né? Algumas questões de ordem da geopolítica, não é? é e aí pegando também, acho que a última intervenção da Sarita colocou muito claro, e acho que várias das questões que estão em jogo. Né? Então, é um pouco... É, eu gostaria que os demais ah, palestrantes, né? o Leslie, o Tian, ah, o Alessandro e ah, o Paul, pudessem também comentar um pouco, ah, a partir da análise que eles estão fazendo, né? como que eles estão pensando essas questões não é? da, da convivência desses sistemas Uh, o Paul falou no, na, na combinação de um sistema não é uh, de propriedade intelectual ao mesmo tempo com um sistema de open access não é, é como que a gente, a gente pode olhar para essa questão tendo em vista que o sistema de propriedade intelectual ele está muito ancorado numa questão dos estados-nação depende de uma questão aí territorial é claro que há todos os acordos internacionais que regulam os sistemas de propriedade mas há uma questão aí do Estado-nação fortíssima. Ao mesmo tempo, nós temos as grandes corporações, caráter transnacional, atuando nos países, e a forma como elas gerenciam, digamos, a propriedade intelectual, ela enfim, é transnacional. Não é? Então, é dizer, a gente pensar questões, não é, seja do livre acesso né, ou do commons, que também exige uma, um regime institucional né, de proteção à comunidade pública, é, política que a cria e a participa, né? É, como que vocês estão pensando essas questões no plano dessa dessa convivência, não é? Que não é nada pacífica, ao contrário, não é? Quer dizer, você tem ah, estados nacionais competindo entre si, não é? Então, quer dizer, isso repercute internamente na forma como eles vão regular o acesso ou não ao conhecimento produzido. Não é? ah. 
uh, I don't know much about intellectual property rights uh, and, and alternative licensings and all those kind of things, even though I try to read them and follow them. Uh, and I follow the debate at the World Intellectual Property Organization and the development agenda that some of my colleagues are involved with in terms of advocacies, in terms of um, exceptions and so forth. And what we're seeing uh, is that that rising tension, right? Increasing power of the multinational to dictate terms that then are imposed across national boundaries. Uh, and so this is, this is more and more of a citizen's rights as well, going back to my argument earlier about citizen's rights. And I think most people are not aware of how their rights are increasingly being in, taken away by these, these uh, very, very powerful uh, 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 harmonized policy across countries. So, uh, so at the first instant, we need to draw attention to them, how they may impact in terms of access to, to medicines, to all kinds of, of public goods, uh, and also uh, uh, advocate for alternative kind of regime. There's a project, you can look it up on the internet, it's called the Open African Innovation Research and Training. Open African Innovation Research and Training, it's open air for short. Uh, and they, uh, they've been doing research in that very area in terms of looking at alternative uh, 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 licensing regimes of, of, uh, of, of um, I hate to use the term intellectual property, but of scientific output and other intellectual outputs using different kinds of uh, licensing schemes that would benefit South Africa rather than the somebody else. Yeah. So take a look at some of their research reports. So, uh, why is it turned off? <laughs> uh, um, it's it's a very difficult uh, question for me because my my skills are not that that uh, uh, wide. Uh, I want to say that in, in, in I mean, while while you face on on one side the the, the, the of course transnational scope scope of of, of multinational corporations and uh, global agreements and intellectual property rights and so on. It's difficult to see something emerging from, from grassroots movements, but still is, I think that both movements of, of, of opinion and of action in the world of, of commons are, are important to, to change things, even at the policy level. Uh, so I think it's important to, to, to push that boundary a little bit. Um, one proposal that has been circulating and I've been, I've been hearing, which, which will be interesting as one of the maybe steps that could allow us to uh, build sort of an infrastructure to protect the commons would be to, to have uh, a foundation that would, that would operate sort of, a, sort of like the, the Free Software Foundation or, or the, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but devoted to the global commons. That would, be, that would be very interesting. So an international organization that will take, put money and, and advocacy and, and lawyers and, and, and think tanks and so on into the, the global, the, the evolution of the, 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 the expansion of the global commons. That would be the, a great uh, achievement, and maybe, uh, who knows, sooner or later. Dizia que o, você perguntou mais para os outros, né? A única, a única coisa que eu agregaria é o seguinte: eu acho que a gente precisa de novas institucionalidades, tanto no plano interno dos países, quanto nas relações geopolíticas em, é, em termos mundiais. E é que essa, na verdade, mas esse aparato institucional ele é um reflexo das lutas, ou seja, as lutas é que são os movimentos sociais, as pressões sociais, é que, de algum modo, vão poder ou não fazer alguma transformação é, nesse aparato. Né? Eu acho que o aparato, o aparato institucional, na verdade, ele reflete um determinado momento de relação de forças na, na, nas sociedades, nas relações entre os países. Então, eu acho que tudo depende de como, em que medida, essa é uma questão que toca a sociedade, e é que essa sociedade se coloca né, e, 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 e impõe né, e pressiona para haver transformações nesse aparato legal. on the topic which we were pursuing, but there's a ge some general comment. No, I was... Oh, in response to that. No, I thought that the, qu the responses were, so far, were... Uh, Are there any more questions? Uh, 
I'm Cameron Allen. Pos. So uh, in part, in part, res in response to that, and in part also to the the, the point Paul was making at near the end, that we have a there's this tension. Fundamentally, it's kind of, I'll, I'll use an example. Um, in Europe at the moment, we are doing two things at the same time. Um, we're trying to construct, reconstruct contractually a commons through licensing arrangements like Creative Commons, um, in the same way that Paul Paul touched on. And at the same time, we're arguing two contradictory things. One is that text and data mining shouldn't, isn't subject to copyright legislation. And the other is that it should be um, accepted from copyright legislation. And I wonder, I, I don't, don't have an answer, but um, one of the things that I wonder is when we pursue all three of those strategies at the same time, and we do so in a narrow geographical and legal context, we're often opening ourselves up for issues across these jurisdictions. Um, so we're appropriating tools, we're, we're reappropriating copyright on one side um, in, a, in, a, in a political context. Um, the, the reappropriation of those tools is an interesting thing, but at the same time we're making ourselves subject to them. Um, and our choices to do that in Europe can obviously have a, a big effect on how that plays out in the wider world. So I don't think I've, I've not simplified the issue at all, but I think it's a really important one. This is very. It's, this is an. It's an important. It's an important point that that Cameron has has raised, which proceeds uh, from, I think, two two levels of uh, or of misunderstanding. Uh, one uh, one is a misunderstanding uh, about the importance uh, of new forms of licensing intellectual property um, and that is uh, sort of the notion that uh, we have to that we have to use uh, different different kinds of licensing and different kinds of, uh, of contracts in the form of something like copy copyleft uh, because copyright uh, is uh, uh, is uh, injurious uh, to the uh, to the uh, easy uh, development of easy and open access. Uh, the, uh, the, this, you know, the, the second, uh, I think, uh, lack of understanding is that uh, uh, the copyright license uh, developed to support open source, whether that's GPL or of the variants of that license is the key uh, to opening uh, uh, the development of software uh, to uh, large collaborative organizations and can be the key uh, to similarly opening uh, scientific activity uh, so that it can enjoy the same power and benefit uh, which was suddenly displayed by an alternative means of producing uh, software. Uh, we could have a long conversation on this, but uh, let me did sort of declare sort of uh, my, my view about this. First, uh, one has to understand uh, that open source software which uses uh, uh, copyleft licenses is based on the power of copyright law. It is copyright law which allows uh, licenses to be repurposed for different ends than they came to be uh, uh, to serve in the hands of publishing companies. Uh, that was the genius uh, of Stallman uh, in producing a different kind of license which is copyright. When, when you use open source software, you accept the license requirements, which is a license directly from you, to you, from the originators uh, of, the, uh, of, of the program 
that you're like. It doesn't come from the person who gave you the program. It comes from them. And you are bound, therefore, uh, to do certain things uh, which will enable this, uh, ma this material, uh, this knowledge, or this information uh, to be reused, repurposed, uh, and transmitted to others in the same way. Okay? So without the platform of copyright law, which happens to be one of the most fully developed standardized systems in the law, internationally standardized systems of the law, which allowed an organization like Creative Commons uh, to think about actually generating a form of license which would be applicable across many, many uh, uh, legal jurisdictions and to get that rolled out, you couldn't have uh, the effectiveness uh, which the licenses provide. But the second point I want to make is that the licenses were one element uh, in the success of copyright and not the most important one. The most important one were the preceding developments uh, in, in computer-mediated telecommunications networks and the fact that you began to have a wide distribution of the equipment which provided, but certainly did not universally provide, access to those networks. The networks enabled what the innovation of peer production, as, uh, as uh, uh, Jochai Bentler wanted to call it, uh, namely distributed production. It is spatially distributed production. It was production which allowed the mobilization of a mass of activity uh, to work together uh, to produce new forms of software in a different fashion. What was important in that development, in realizing it, were advances in the writing of software architectures, which realized uh, the point that was made by Herbert Simon in an important, many years ago, an important essay on the architecture of complexity, that uh, the modularization was not enough uh, if you wanted people to collaborate on some building a complex uh, system. You, what you needed was semi-decomposability. The architecture had to allow people to work in a way that did not require tearing up other people's work in order to advance uh, the functional properties of the system that you were buying and in order to make it more readily dis maintainable. So m my point is that w when you look at something which is a, s a success like open source, you have to understand what the conditions which enabled it to speedily uh, uh, become an alternative production regime which could be globally adopted and which could uh, allow scaling which had not been achieved before, which uh, allow uh, open entry into large uh, software produ uh, production systems uh, because uh, it, it, it didn't matter uh, very much uh, whether people working in one module uh, would do something which would uh, create a series of loops which would not interact with the rest of the system. The modularization and the work of maintainers in the, uh, in the large projects enable that. What this means for me in this present context is first that the language that what we have in the new movement is the uh, idea of transformation of science along the lines of open source. So I think the terminology that we should use for this is a valid terminology which is uh, Open, uh, open source inspired science, okay? Open source uh, restructuring of science. But, but this, and that's the last point I want to make, is that it's a difference between working with a metaphor, which is a self-contradictory statement. You know, imagine the state uh, is, an, is an organism and think of all the bad consequences of that line of thinking uh, that, uh, that emerged. But, a metaphor has a life that frees you to imagine new things, and it's there a source of creativity, but it's a transient state because when you come to try to implement it, then you see that you know, the, 
the state is, is not uh, an organism. And the states don't belong in a, for, in a food chain like other organisms. And that if you try to implement that, you get yourself into some pretty nasty lines of thought, okay? So there's an important distinction between a paradigm and a metaphor. And to take open source as a paradigm for science is, I believe, and I think uh, this is a view I expressed at an early point when I began working uh, for 10, 10 years on the proj projects on understanding how open source production works. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, John Wilbanks, with whom I discussed this, sort of wrote a very nice uh, paper in which he, uh, 19, uh, 2009, in which he said we should understand that what open source did, its revolution, is distributed is distributed collaboration. It enabled that and with lots of things. So we should look at the aspects of science which can be successfully distributed in that way, which can be scaled up, which can be left open, uh, and not think uh, that simply that because it uses open source software tools, it is open source software. Software is a, is a very different animal from science for lots of reasons which we could, which I could elaborate on and which John Wilbanks uh, articulated uh, four of them. Uh, there, I think there are six. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, four was enough. Uh, so I think it's important uh, for, to have this, motion, this movement go forward that we not get into the situation in which, uh, uh, in which Alessandro's uh, paper with which I agree everything he said except the final slide in which he said open science threatens open society. Uh, it threatens existing structures in society. It threatens uh, the existing regime of science. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it. Okay, I think that's it. That's fine. Okay.